Council meeting to order. Allie, could you please take roll? Council Member Bruce Bassett. Here. Council Member Jane Brom. Here. Council Member Mike Saro. Here. Council Member Mike Grady. Here. Council Member Dan Grouse. Here. Deputy Mayor L. Jenke. Yes. Yeah. Mayor Jim Pierman. Here. Great. And thank you all for coming. We just finished a uh, study session on our pedestrian bike facilities plan and uh, we're going to start out the evening <coughs> with a special uh, comment uh, with past city manager <coughs> by our city manager uh, rich thank you mr. mayor I, I want to just take a, a couple of minutes to um, acknowledge the passing of uh, one of my predecessors and a friend and mentor um, Larry Rose city manager in um, the 70s and uh, 80s passed away on April 21st uh, here on Mercer Island and uh, I wanted to just say a few words about him um, Larry worked as city manager here from 1975 to 1987 and um, Larry would would say he's proud in his career for many things but probably most proud of the community center at Mercer View he also was the uh, inspiration and the energy behind the creation of the Mercer Island Arts Council, the creation of our Marine Patrol, uh, Bicentennial Park. Larry is the guy that brought in Youth and Family Services as a private nonprofit agency under the city's umbrella. Uh, and we, to this day, are still the only city in King County that, that does human services that way and at such a high level. Um, in many ways, Larry's the reason why a bunch of the facilities on uh, on Mercer Island are where they're at. He was the architect of the the concept of uh, land moving land uh, to the city's best advantage. Uh, Farmers Insurance used to be here; they are now downtown because of Larry. Uh, we own Mercerdale Park, and it became a park because of uh, land arrangements and land swaps with the school district and the same is true for our maintenance facilities all of that without uh, a, an actual dollar being exchanged between the entities this was all done by some very uh, creative uh, land trades uh, he's a very creative guy I was uh, happy to work for him he's the guy that hired me in 1979 and I learned a lot from him uh, he uh, right out of uh, school and in the beginning of World War II was um, enrolled in the Merchant Marine Academy, served in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, and uh, in the North Sea, spent time in the Naval Reserve, was uh, for a short time the, what was then in effect the city manager in Carmel, California, later in Tiburon and Laguna Beach, and before he came here to Mercer Island. So uh, I, I just like to pass along our thoughts and prayers with his family they've been island residents for many many years and uh, just wanted to say those things about Larry Great. I think uh, I spoke with Larry last year didn't Larry bring the agenda bill number format to the city the the agenda bill format the structure that we have at the city today was based on uh, design that he, he did back in the 70s yes and uh, just so that you understand, we are now on Agenda Bill 4,629. So you didn't have to say that because uh, I've got about 3,500 <laughs> of those. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I had a nice chat with uh, Larry last year uh, when we dedicated uh, the plaza uh, down there and we talked about his commitment to the city. And uh, I think everything in life is all incremental, and his increment was significant in the development of the city. And I wish uh, Larry's family all the best and thanks for his service. Uh, and if we would take a moment uh, to uh, honor Larry, that would be great. Right. And once again, if, if Larry's family is listening, thank you very much. Um, with that, um, we're going to go on to um, appearances. Um, tonight we have a public hearing, which I imagine some of you are here for. It's on the Shoreline Master Program. Um, and the Shoreline Plan, what we'll do is, due to a public hearing, we will open the floor up for comments at that time for that agenda bill. So the first appearance is you don't need to speak on the, uh, the shoreline plan at this time. You can wait until the agenda bill comes forward or you can speak now. But we would ask that you take either one. 
to speak on. Um, with that, before we start with appearances, we have a guest with us this evening, Chris Kelsey, who's been working on a special project for us. And Chris, before we open up to appearances, uh, would you please come forward and tell us about the good work you've been doing? I'm going to have Ben come do it. Okay. He's our president. So yeah. <laughs> it's always good to bring gifts. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak before the council. My name is Benson Wong. Uh, I live at One Holly Hill uh, Drive, Mercer Island. I have the privilege of being the uh, current president of the Mercer Island Community Fund. And as you folks know, you know this community fund was formed uh, over 25 years ago, and uh, it accepts contributions from the public. Uh, and as a result, we are able to make grants to organizations. Uh, on the island which promote uh, social welfare, education, recreation, arts and culture, and other aspects of life on Mercer Island. Uh, the thing that the community fund likes to, wants to do is basically to promote and enhance the quality of life on the island. And um, one of the things that we learned recently was that uh, a great event that happens every year, um, the fireworks at uh, Luther Burbank, uh, basically on Saturday, the summer celebration was in jeopardy of not, or is in jeopardy of not happening because of budgetary cuts. We understand that uh, $22,850 needs to be raised in order for that event to occur. So on behalf of the Mercer Island Community Fund uh, Board of Directors, uh, of which Chris is also on the board, I'm pleased to announce that the board approved a grant, uh, a matching grant of up to $10,000 uh, in order to help save this event and we are encouraging the public and uh, businesses to come forward and to join us in saving this event and so um, uh, we're starting off the campaign tonight and I know Chris has made some buttons and we'd like to give each one of you folks uh, a button to wear and to basically help spread the word about this campaign and again we are here to uh, match uh, individual uh, donations and sponsorships of up to ten thousand dollars in order to learn more about the campaign folks can go to our website uh, the, the community fund website at www.micommunityfund.org or also by going to the city of Mercer Island website and so uh, we look forward to uh, a successful campaign and hopefully uh, everybody will be there uh, on uh, I think July 10, I believe, <laughs> uh, for the event. Anyway, thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. And please send our thanks to the, the board. This is great. Um, the community fund, I think, goes overlooked a lot of times for the good things it does. And hopefully this will get you some good publicity on top of helping us on a very uh, a great cause for the community. I'd, I'd hate to see the fireworks not happen. I know that's a big thing in our community. So thank you very much, and please extend our thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Chris, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, with that, we're going to get on to regular appearances. Um, if you, yeah. Can I make a, a motion first just to? Sure. Um, I'd, um, I'd like to move to table agenda bill 4617. Um, just, this is the shared emergency rapid response apparatus in our local. Uh, the reason I'm making the motion now is just to enable the people in the audience who are here for that bill, the, our staff, to go home and not have to spend three or four hours waiting for this to come up. Um, there, there's, the, the, if, well, I guess some seconds. I'll speak to the motion. Okay, great. Yeah, and I just the um, I'd like to, and talking with Rich. This is something I think that could benefit from discussion before the Public Safety Committee meeting. There's um, there are issues that are raised by the agenda bill, which I, I'd like to air in the Public Safety Committee and see if we can address um, or get staff's input on before coming before the full council and discussing it. Right. And talking with Rich, uh, there is uh, support for doing this, and it's appropriate in the new format of the safety, Public Safety Committee to air it in that committee. So um, I'm supportive of this motion. Anyone else like to speak to it? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. That will be Agenda Bill 4617 will be moved then. Um, all right, back to appearances. If anyone would like to come forward, please come forward. Uh, state your name and address in three minutes. Honorable, Honorable Mayor and Honorable Council Members, I'm Robert Thorpe, 5800 West Mercer Way. I came here to inform you of a, uh, an award that the Open Space Conservative Trust 
uh, was presented to by the Farrington Foundation. But I did want to start by saying I had the honor of serving for two years with Larry Rose on the staff. Um, a good friend of mine in the audience helped me to secure the position of planner uh, in 1971, and it was an incredible, you meet people on your life, that journey, and that kind of turn the tiller and change your life. Larry Rose was one of those people. The agenda bill is a great legacy. And how he approached things, how he empowered staff, how he changed the paradigm in the city was very phenomenal. So his spirit is with us here, and uh, I'm here to witness that he was one of the best that ever served the city. So thank you for taking the time for that. I also wanted to let you know that the Farmington Association, at an event the other night, provided a plaque in recognition of the Places That Matter, Pioneer Park Projects, Farrington Foundation to the Open Space Conservancy Trust. And I know this on the agenda later, and the chair suggested that I inform you of this. We're going to take it to the board, and I assume it will come back to the council to be put in one of the uh, display cases for the city. So um, it was uh, given to us uh, a week ago at a presentation, so that will come back to you uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the uh, City Council? Okay, seeing none, we'll close appearances now. Oh, do we have one? Oh, I'm sorry. As I understand it, I can address the actual master plan. You can now or during the agenda bill? I might as well do it now. Okay, I may please. I use my laptop as well. Yep. Um, so, I'm Brock Howell. I'm the King County Program Director for the organization FutureWise, and I reside at uh, 8548 uh, 2nd Avenue Northeast, Seattle, Washington, 98115. FutureWise is a statewide uh, land use organization that works to protect our farmlands, to protect our rivers, streams, and lakes, um, and to make sure we build healthy, livable communities. Um, we've been engaged in the shoreline management uh, plan process for quite some time now, um, starting with two comment letters from last, last spring in May. So uh, with that in mind, I provide these comments. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the Mercer Island Shoreline Master Program. We appreciate the time and effort that the Mercer Island staff, consultants, planning commissioners, city council members, and residents are devoting to this important update. Washington shorelines need improved policies to manage them, and the Shoreline Master Program is an opportunity to update those policies. While significant progress has been made on improving the water quality of Lake Washington, uh, there, continue, there continues to be major problems with the lake and its tributaries. For example, Lake Washington is a habitat of threatened uh, Chinook salmon, the threatened steelhead trout, and the threatened bull trout. These threatened species are one of the reasons we need to better manage Lake Washington itself. Uh, so again, uh, for last year's May 5th, 2010 hearing on the SMP, Fishwise submitted two comment letters. Uh, we included extensive scientific documentation on buffers and ecological functions of streams, wetlands, and lakes. Also included were two guidance documents on restoration planning and establishing buffers. Uh, while meeting the SMP guideline requirements and we want to ensure that what we submitted to the Planning Commission uh, ends up in your official uh, documents as well for your decision. Uh, our previous comment letters comment, uh, provided, uh, provided comment on many topics um, which continue to apply with few exceptions. We continue to recommend the changes in our previous letters uh, and uh, let me just highlight a few that we think are very important. Uh, first, uh, that an inventory and environment system that treats all private land the same regardless of its characteristics and level of development, I think needs to be included. We believe that it provides an inadequate buffer system, that there's a non-existent exemption review process. It's not in there. Uh, there's avoidance of regulations that actually complement uh, accomplished mitigation sequency, the lack of systematic method of compensatory mitigation for development impacts, uh, the repetition of SMP guidelines stemmates as regulations rather than implementing them with detailed regulations. So basically, it's just reiterating the same I, I'm thing. I'm going to start to interrupt, but I'm going to have to okay. is there a wrap up. Is it is this? Uh, I have your letter of May second. Yeah. Is it pretty much in that letter? Yeah, it's pretty much in that letter. Okay. We want to make sure that the previous. Uh, 
letters that were submitted to the Planning Commission are incorporated because it goes into more detail. Great. And the, the final thing is, is we're very concerned about the Shoreline Master Plan. It's, uh, we do a lot of work on SMPs throughout the region. We're the, the main organization that's looking at them. And from what my planning staff is saying, telling me is that it's the worst out of the ones that they've reviewed. Um, so we're very concerned, and we hope you reconsider uh, the language that's in it. Great. Thank well, you. thank you for coming this evening. And I got a nod that uh, that those uh, letters will be in front of the council. Is that right, Tim? All the future wise letters. Make sure of it. Okay. Great. Thank you for coming. Uh, would anyone else like to address the city council at this time? Please come forward. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I just want to advise. Uh, excuse me, could you please state your name and address for the yeah. record? Vincent Wormser, W O R M S E R, 9827 Southeast 42nd Place, Mercer Island. Great. Thank you. Please. Um, this is just. I probably want to address this to the people out there. If any of you people are interested in uh, making some adjustment, say if you have a waterfront light and have a lot and want to put a piling in or something, you better start saving your money. I went through that. First of all, you have to have the state come out and send the man out and investigate it. And that takes a while and a, a pretty good uh, money you got to pay for that. Then the then the, uh, the the national people were involved too, and the state, and then the city on uh, Mercer Island. There's one, two, three people that have to go through your uh, permission to work on anything that might be in the water, a piling that you got to repair or something like that. And I just want these guys to know it's not a piece of cake. When you get three big bills for that, you all think about, I wonder why I did this. So if anybody has any questions, I, if not, I, as long as they know about it. OK. Great. Well, thank you for coming this evening. Yeah. Would anyone else like to address the city council? Okay, seeing none, we're going to close appearances and go on to the consent calendar. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Mr. Mayor, I would like to uh, request, <laughs> I know you're shy, <laughs> that we move Agenda Bill 4623 to regular business, please. Okay, we will move that into the first business, first item under regular business. It'll be a that, long night. That leaves us with uh, Agenda Bill 4528. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Uh, I would like to just give one sentence worth of. Uh, we need a second. Okay. All right. And on that, I'd, I'd like to say thanks to council for approving the the not weed addition to that. It didn't cost much and will have a big impact. And great job to staff for getting that uh, project to move forward at such low cost. Okay. Check out that cost, you guys. <laughs> it's one of the best ones we've had. I know that's a, yeah. saving half the cost of the project. That's great. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let's go on to regular business. We're going to start out with Agenda Bill 4623 and Councilmember Grady. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'd like to call on both the, the, the two chiefs. Uh, I think we have both of them in the audience. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're back again. Uh, Chief Tubbs, can you give me an explanation of... Um, the surrounding communities, um, all of our neighbors, uh, do they allow similar type of sale of uh, fireworks? It varies from community to community. We have a number of communities in King County that have banned them, and we have a number of communities in King County that have not. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly provide you with a, a map. I, I don't remember if we included it this year, but we've included it in previous agenda bills. 
And I read through your agenda bill, so thanks again for putting that together. And I do recall back in, what was it, 2005, where we sent out a survey and 55% of the residents on Mercer Island wanted a ban of all fireworks on Mercer Island. And we continued to allow um, fireworks not only to be sold, but also to be discharged. Um, my question is, uh, because we've allowed that, can you speak to the number of responses you had last year? And I'd like uh, Chief Holmes to do the same thing, if you don't mind. Sure. Last year, we had one event that was attributable, possibly attributable, to a fireworks um, event. It was some brush uh, beauty bark that had caught on fire. Fire department responded. The fire was out on arrival. There was no damage as a result of that, no financial damage. It was included in the report. Okay. And no injuries associated with any events uh, over the 4th of July period as well. Okay. Chief Holmes? Yes, and for the record, Ed Holmes, your police chief, we respond to probably an average of 25 noise and or fireworks complaints, roughly. And, and those are typically cleared with uh, just a warning most of the time or confiscate the fireworks. Um, occasionally, there's some property damage. We've had some porta potty um, in years past that we suspect um, large type fire crackers were let off inside. But um, there's not a lot of property damage, but you know, typically there's some. We had, uh, yeah. So, um, was there any overtime associated with uh, these responses, either with the police department or the fire department? Well, I know that we have. Uh, uh, full staffing that evening. We we bring in graveyard shift a little early, and swing shift will usually hold over. So there's there's some associated with that. None with the fire department. I, I don't know about this last year, but in years previous to that, we've had some uh, time from our parks crews to go out and spend some time out in the park system to make sure that illegal fire or fireworks which are not allowed in the parks to be shot off. So I assume we probably had some staff out last year. So there is, it sounds like there is some added cost for continuing to allow fireworks to be discharged on Mercer Island. Well, we, we yeah, I mean, we would staff that certainly uh, um, almost regardless of what, uh, the fireworks situation. They get lit off, um, so we would have that kind of staffing, I think, regardless of whether there was a um, direction by the council to allow them or not. I think they would still continue. So to a certain extent. So if we were to ban fireworks like so many of our neighboring communities have done, uh, one, I'm curious on your thoughts on that, and uh, two, I'm curious on what the staffing would be if we were to ban fireworks on Mercer Island. Well, it would give uh, the patrol officers some, um, they could take some action then if there was some, even the legal, as uh, are termed in, uh, Chief Tubbs's agenda bill. It would give the officers some, they could take some sort of action against the offenders, if you will, in those cases. Um, and I would imagine, like a lot of things, there would be initial, um, some education period, there would be more staffing on the front end in the first few years, and until uh, people realize that they can't do that here, then maybe they would get more with uh, that program. And maybe we wouldn't have as much of a need for staffing in the out years, but initially, we would have to have more staffing for that. Mm -hmm. Chief Holmes? Or, um, Tubbs? Uh, no impact of the fire department. And it's worth noting for the council as well, if the council decides that they want to implement a ban, there is a one-year waiting period. So in other words, this year, that ban would not be effective. It would be effective next year. That's per state law. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, Chief, um, we've talked many, every year about why the Kiwanis use this to raise money mm -hmm. and three years ago we had a representative from the club come up and promise that they would look into alternative means for fundraising um, one can you tell me how much money they raise uh, selling the fireworks the last figure that I heard which was from last year was $18,000 I, I don't know what they're projecting this year okay and are they exploring other ways to raise money uh, without having to sell fireworks? They've not communicated their strategy to me. Okay. I'm going to make the offer again this year. Uh, $18,000 we could probably raise in about an hour and a half. Um, it, again, seems so contrary to me that we have an, 
an organization such as the Kiwanis selling fireworks to raise money for programs that benefit kids. The, the algebra there is just foreign to me. So uh, again, I'm making a plea to you and to Chief Holmes to sit down with the Kiwanis and once again tell them Council Member Mike Grady is willing to sit down with you and put a plan together to raise that money so you don't have to come back every year and ask for a permit to sell fireworks. Would you do that? It, is that a direction from the council? No, no, no. no. Mm. My, no. This, we don't give direction from the council. I'd like to move that we approve the permit to allow the sale of consumer fireworks by the Mercer Island Kiwanis Club in conjunction with Independence Day 2011. Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Discussion? Thanks, Chief. Yes, there is discussion. Okay. Um, I would, for the record, like that information conveyed to the Kiwanis. And yes. again, the, the and, and if and if the council is not willing to do it, I'll do it personally. So, Chief, if you would give me the contact name for the Kiwanis, I'd be happy to talk to them in person. Okay. Again, I, I really do find it just beyond comprehension that every year we have to have this discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bruce? If I could, I uh, have a question for Chief Holmes. Would that be all right? Uh, of the calls that you had last year, do you have a, a sense of how many of those were for uh, the legal Kiwanis-style fireworks versus for the illegal reservation-style fireworks? The sense I have is most of them were for the legal ones. I mean, it's very, very hard to differentiate between the two. We get noise complaints, and we're not sure always what what they are, uh, what the type of firework is. But based on the fact that we don't take a lot of reports for illegal fireworks, um, I figure that most of them are for the legal type. So I guess my sense, though, is that the, n the illegal ones are firecrackers and things like that that make a lot more noise than the legal ones? Am they're I missing that? They're typically louder or they go much higher in the air, far more um, bang to them, if you will. Um, I don't know how best to describe it other than much more. Um, they're higher on the charts of what they can do. Uh, the, the, the sounds they make, the sounds they emit, as well as how high up in the sky they go. Um, so there's be the difference. Let's put it on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, it passes. We go on. Chiefs, thanks so much. Okay, um, now we're going to go to our public hearing. This is on Shoreline Master uh, Program. Um, at this point, we're going to open it up as a public hearing. You please come forward if you wish to speak to the council on this. Uh, so your name, your address, and you have three minutes. And the light's up there just so uh, if you haven't done this before. Um, when you're down two and a half minutes, the yellow light will go on. And when you hit three minutes, the red light will come on and it's flashing. Just so you're, you're kind of keeping pace with what's going on. So with that, we're uh, going to... Uh, Mr. Mayor, oh. I think Tim has a couple of words before preface. Just a couple. Yep. Okay, before we open it up then, Tim, please. Um, I just wanted to alert you, you have a packet in front of you that is a new insert into your binder. Mm -hmm. uh, it is called a matrix of comments and issues that can go at the back of your binder. And I just wanted to highlight this. This is the method that we are proposing to use to keep track of comments and issues uh, that you have already given us uh, and that we will hear tonight and as we go along uh, into the future. Um, it's our hope that um, after this evening's, uh, we'll have a fairly complete list and we'll be able to address each of those with staff analysis, comments, and perhaps recommendations when we come back to you on May 17th so that we can go through this list uh, addressing each of the issues or information. Um, we'll go as quickly or as slowly as you want. Um, information that the Planning Commission has received <coughs> is available online at the city's website. Go to the front page, click on the Shoreline Master Program, and you can find all of the information from the 29 Planning Commission meetings, including all the correspondence that's in, as well as uh, all of the studies. Um, 
So that's it. We're here to uh, we're here to help you tonight as as we go through the thing. But mostly, we want to hear from the community and receive their input. Great. Thanks, Tim. I've got a letter in front of me from FutureWise. It's May 2nd. I believe that there was reference to two letters. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Both of those letters had been received and evaluated and reviewed uh, during the planning commission process. We'd be happy to include those uh, in your packet. If okay, you if you would, um, I guess the other uh, letter uh, besides May 2nd, if you could we'll get the distribute other two, that to us. We'll get the other in the packet for next okay. time. Okay, great. Very Thank good. you. All right, with that. Mr. Mayor, yes. uh, a question though on the schedule, and this is for you too, Tim. Uh, we're showing that uh, the next round would be on May 17th, uh, the, the meeting which has been moved from the Monday to the Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And then I note on the 6th of June that we also have a agenda bill, but it puts in parentheses <coughs> if needed. So uh, what I'd like to do is put a placeholder in here, Mr. Mayor, for a discussion when we get to the planning schedule to ensure that we do in fact have uh, an additional discussion on June 6th because I was not uh, privy to the um, discussions for moving the meeting from the 16th to the 17th. Okay. Great. Mr. Wait. Mayor, I'd just like to point out that, uh, especially for the folks out there who are going to make comment, that this, uh, Director Stewart, really seems like a nice piece of uh, work right here. And for the folks out there, what I'm looking at is uh, it'll have your name, uh, the issue and information that you bring up, and then a staff, a call for the staff. Uh, response and, and uh, the council action. So I think that's a real effective uh, management tool there, especially for the folks making public comment. Great. Okay, with that, we will open up the floor. The public hearing is officially open. If you'd like to come forward, uh, please state your name and address. Yep, please. Hi, good evening. I'm uh, Sean Perry, 8320 Avalon Drive, and uh, tonight I'm here to address the council on behalf of the uh, Mercer Island Beach Club and the 500 member families of the Beach Club. There was uh, the Planning Commission came up with a recommendation to repair and replace existing docks. This is of critical importance to the Beach Club. The Beach Club's been around since almost 60 years now. Some of the docks were in place in 1955. Um, as, as evidence of uh, some photos. These docks are the lifeblood of the beach club. And if there's some kind of cat catastrophic event, for example, the day dock, if it were torn apart and it couldn't be replaced, the moorage at the beach club would go away. And uh, that moorage is a big revenue producer for the beach club. The board of trustees, on behalf of all the membership, is going to submit a letter this evening in support of that recommendation of the Planning Commission and we'll drop it off. On a separate matter, it notes in that Planning Commission recommendation the legal, uh, illegal dock and it's, that's going to be a confusing interpretation what a legal dock is, especially for docks that were installed prior to permits. And so under legal counsel, I understand that is a legal dock. If there's no law, you build what you want. So the council may want to review that and help your staff establish what is the understanding of an ex existing dock. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So hands to, you. Uh, to the city clerk would be great. Thanks, Sean. Great. Anyone else like to address the city council? Good evening. My name is George Smith. I live at 6820 96th Avenue Southeast, where I've been there since 1968. It's on the water. And um, I was the one, one of the two who led the vociferous opposition to the original shoreline master plan, which was a draconian document. And we're able to turn that around and send it back to the commission for reworking. And it came out with a, with a document that we all could live with and have lived with for a long, long time. I'm very proud of the present Planning Commission. They've done a, one heck of a job in coming up with a, with a plan that is livable and it's useful and it's implementable, if that's a word, Dan. Uh, despite despite uh, 288 pages of shoreline master plan laws, rules, and, and uh, guidance, I would have given up in disgust had I been handed 288 pages from on high telling me what I can do as a Planning Commission member. And uh, they persevered, 
and did a great job. So I'm here to support this plan. I'm just uh, addressing my comments to um, uh, the Chairman Adam Cooper's first three pages here, and I'm supporting of this plan. I think they did a great job. There are things we can nitpick, but by and large, it's a great plan. I urge your adoption. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just to put one more item. Don't forget who, whose rules and regulations caused the old floating bridge to sink. Would anyone else like to address the city council? Good evening. I'm Art Vertner. I live at 8710 85th Avenue Southeast on Mercer Island. Um, I'm here with a letter, and I'll give a copy of it back here, for the council objecting to a portion of the uh, new actually it's an existing rules and regulations but also included in the new concerning those of us who live next to street ends and the kind of the current um, way it's written is there are about 19 street ends another three or four parks and a series of utility uh, uh, right-of-ways which now require a 50-foot easement on each side as cleared zone for the the properties that own that basically denying the, the people uh, who own those pieces of property the right to develop in that 50 foot it's a extended um, setback if you will as opposed to the 10 foot which is required in addition uh, as a property owned two property owners private property owners can agree to jointly use that space if they if they agree to it and they file with the state uh, a letter of intent to do that those of us who live next to street ends are basically denied that because the city is unlikely to agree to let us use our setbacks in any manner of speaking. What that basically does is deny the use of that property for us without compensation. And um, I thought you might be interested in a little piece of economics that I did. If you were to take at the current rate, I'm using my rate for lineal footage of value, and you took the, the uh, half mile that this sets aside, it's $52 million of valuation. So either you're not collecting on $52 million worth of valuation of property taxes currently, or you're about to get all of the property owners appealing and having their property reduced accordingly. Now, my economics are certainly open to debate. It was done based on my taxes, based on my plot. I'm not sure I'm average by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not sure that I was accurate. But I will suggest that it is a huge cost in taxation for the city over the course of how many years to have a view because these um, this 50 foot does not deny access to the public which is a stated value in in the plan there's nothing about access as far as that it's simply a view corridor at best and finally I spoke today with the planning uh, folks and learned that in the last four years there's really only been one time that this has even come up so you're going to spend in in the form of a property owner either challenging it or someone challenging the, the structure that's in the the, the right-of-way or the easement so I've submitted a letter with my comments and I appreciate your consideration I've also included draft language for changing the law so that we would have that valuation back in our tax base thank you would anyone else like to address the council okay. good evening um, I'm Alan Foltz, uh, Mayor Perlman. I appreciate you asking me back. I was here last uh, week and presented uh, a situation regarding one of the SMP codes and uh, your projected codes uh, regarding uh, dredging. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm with Waterfront Construction, 205 Northeast North Lake Way in Seattle. Um, the, uh, the current code... Uh, has a restriction that uh, dredging is not allowed in uh, uh, spawning areas. Uh, this is, is realistic. However, uh, the other municipalities that uh, I permit with dredging work don't have that particular uh, restriction. And they've left it up to the Corps of Engineers and the Washington State Fish and Wildlife. Along the north shore of Mercer Island is an area where there's been declining spawning for many years. It uh, has a potential of returning if the site can be uh, mitigated with spawning gravel, as has been documented by uh, Fish and Wildlife in a uh, letter that uh, you have in your file that uh, I haven't seen. It's, it's in that new matrix that I'm looking to see. And Larry Fisher sent a letter where he actually recommended that Mercer Island change their code 
uh, deleting just that one sentence, uh, which would put the determination of uh, dredging in a spawning area back to Washington State Fish and Wildlife, uh, to ecology, and to the core. Uh, I've already spoken with ecology, and they would permit that uh, for our work here on Mercer Island if it were not in your code. Um, I've also spoken to the Muckleshoot tribe, where Barbara Nightingale said she was she would support that type of a, uh, of a uh, mitigation. So I wish you'd uh, please take a look at that, and if it's possible, remove that one uh, sentence from the uh, existing code. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Dwight Schaefer. I'm at 6958 96th Avenue Southeast. I have participated in some of the uh, planning uh, council meetings uh, and have been uh, generally very favorably impressed with uh, what they've done. Uh, in particular, they had the courage to say that the planning commission has concluded that no scientific or quantitative relationship between the residential dock coverage and significant smolt survival has been conclusively demonstrated. And uh, actually, near as I can tell, it's even stronger than that. And now what I'm saying is that there's probably some loose ends in these documents that need to be cleaned up to be consistent with that if you accept that recommendation. Uh, for example, uh, there's a requirement for translucent canopies uh, for covered moist. Uh, Bellevue doesn't require it, and that's only based on the assumption that coverage will kill smolt. Uh, eliminate the requirements for uh, graded decking and light transmission. Eliminate minimum height requirements for moorage facilities above the uh, ordinary uh, high water mark. Eliminate restoration objective from Exhibit 5, which says decrease amount and impact of overwater and inwater structures through minimization of structure size and the use of innovative materials such as graded decking. Eliminate restoration priority number 4 from Exhibit 5, the reduction of inwater and overwater structures. This actually has a higher priority than water quality even though there's no basis for it. And eliminate the requirement to minimize the number and size of pilings. In addition, pilings are restricted to be steel. And according to the Bellevue draft plan, steel is not even permitted because it corrodes. Uh, and it sets the size limits, even though it's not based on anything structural. And it requires an 18-foot span. Now, most docks have about a 10-foot span of the piling. You've got 18 foot. The size of the joist just grows astronomically. So I, there's unintended consequences that comes from this. It sounds like this was listed from a commercial or an industrial requirement. And it says no more than two moorage piles. Well, if the moorage piles are designed to take lateral loads, dock piles aren't. So if somebody wanted to put in moorage piles, they'd have to tear apart the dock and rebuild it so it didn't look like they had more moorage piles. Don't see any justification for that at all. Uh, Pilot, the uh, Bellevue, for example, uh, does the same as we do, no toxic uh, materials, uh, but they go further and said uh, uh, no materials uh, that will corrode, and it also prohibits coal tar sealant and addressed sewer spills, two of the biggest water quality issues that we're totally silent on. Uh, the third issue is the vegetation. We say non-invasive vegetation. I think we mean, well, I think we mean non-invasive, we said native. Bellevue addressed the issue by saying uh, native or native compatible. I don't think my dwarf fine ma uh, dwarf Japanese maple is going to cause anybody any trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Hi, my name is Dave Douglas, 818 Mill Avenue, Snohomish, Washington, 98290. I'm also the owner of Integrity Shoreline Permitting. Um, I've attended most of the meetings with the Planning Commission and almost feel like they're a second family, along with uh, Mr. Steyer and Mr. Saunders. Um, I've done dozens, if not hundreds, of projects on Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish, and th uh, this is my 14th SMP update. I just came from Hunts Point. And uh, I think your Planning Commission has stood strong in the face of a lot of opposition from uh, extreme environmentalists, the Department of Ecology, and, uh, and, and has really done a great job. Um, I've 
I'm not new to this game. I've been to all these jurisdictions, clear down to Burien, and uh, uh, there are there are checks and balances in place, such as Fish and Wildlife and the Corps of Engineers. And ecology, first of all, on overwater structures, ecology very hastily adopted the RGP3 standards from the Corps of Engineers, rather than doing their own research. And they, uh, they developed a no net loss standard based on what the Corps considers a not likely to adversely affect uh, listed species or critical habitat. Those are two totally different outcomes. If you read all the reports, the Chinook recovery, uh, salmon recovery plan, I've read 1,400 pages of science, and what uh, several people tonight have said, the science is inconclusive um, at best. I don't agree with uh, a lot of what uh, the gentleman said about some of these standards, because knowing the state and federal requirements, I know that you're kind of locked in on those, because you'll never get your state or federal permit if you don't accept those. But your planning commission has done a wonderful job uh, during this entire process over the last year and a half or two, and I fully support absolutely everything in here. One thing I did recommend during the process that they denied is the fact that that street end that the gentleman was talking about, that is very onerous. And to give you one quick example, a project over on, west, uh, on the west side of the island uh, where the uh, city has a, uh, a, an easement right to a old concrete dock that is very impacting, heavily shading, and it's just a mess. Um, a lady put in, or I put in for her, to be able to remove that and put a new dock that would not be any more non-conforming in its place, but because of that rule, she got a brand new dock to the tune of 900 square feet, and that existing is still in place. And so essentially, you kind of shot yourself in the foot with that rule. Barbara Nightingale of Ecology said that she would have liked to approve the project the way it was originally, but because of that, um, that regulation, she was forbid because she has to go by what your SMP says. I would ask you to hold, if, even if you made it 20 feet or something, to give public access a little better. I don't know what joy anyone gets at looking out a, a sewer clean out anyway, to be honest with you, with a bench above it. Um, you must know something I don't. But I would encourage you uh, to please uh, drop that rule and maybe make it 20 feet instead of 10. Thank you for your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And I will have written comments tomorrow. OK, Thank thanks. You. Anyone else? Mayor, council members, my other address is 7438 Southeast 27th, R.W. Thorpe and Associates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cyril, for pointing out that previous letters have been noted and saved me a lot of time tonight, so thank you. Uh, and the mayor only gives me one minute, so I'll uh, try to do this quickly. Um, I have a letter of May 24th and uh, one previously from May 9th, about 22 pages and about 10. I would like to echo that I think the Planning Commission has done a, a incredible job, the staff too, uh, hundreds of hours. I have one little critique of the whole thing. They're they're billing the the commissioners at $103. I thought they worked for three. I don't think that should be in the budget about how much we spent on shorelines. But uh, I'll uh, I'll just do that to tweak uh, the city manager here a little bit tonight. But I I would agree with a lot of things that have been said. Um, I had the honor of being here when Mercer Island and Kirkland. Many of you know uh, staffed the state uh, model program and the SEPA guidelines and worked on those and worked on the 73-74 plan. A lot of that language is in there and Mr. Smith is correct. There was a lot of things that DOE said we had to do and the staff looked at it. My experience, I have worked in the last few years, I've worked for a number of jurisdictions writing them, but also for Thurston County, Okanagan County, Tukwila, Issaquah, Bellevue, working for property owners. Our approach has been to develop case studies to determine how these uh, regulations affect property. There are some problems. Let me give you the three big myths. From my experience, a uh, young man from FutureWise probably wasn't on the planet when we did the one in 71, so I've got a little more experience. DOE review. The myth is, if you don't do it right, DOE will take it over, do it, and tell you how to do it. Total myth. Absolute falsity. Tuckwilla sent theirs in. We got 18 changes. DOE sent it back. It's right. Again and again and again. We did one for, um, for Briar. They said 100 foot setbacks. We settled for 50 foot from stream bearing streams. They adopted it. So that's the myth. It is your plan. You get to do it. And if DOE wants to write it, they have no money to do it. Myth number one. Myth number two is the concept of best available science. As Dr. Pauly testified here, and we've heard time and again, 
a lot of the stuff that's being used is not based on scientific studies that involve peer review. It is not true. They're, they're making this stuff up, they're putting it in there, and says because it's in our DOE regulation. The other thing is what happens, there's only three or four consultants writing these things. They get done, so every city has to hire them, and then the city says, well, go to so-and-so and get your permits. So you have to spend a whole much more money. All shorelines are critical areas. Not so. They even have the term, they even have the stream in, in this, and I think it's deleted. There are no streams on Mercer Island. There are water courses. I've walked virtually every one of them, helped write the, the water course ordinance, the stream ordinance. Do not create a CAO overlay on the shorelines. There are some details that are important, such as water courses not being streams, uh, adopting CO as shorelines. I have a, I have a, help, helping write the, uh, the one, uh, the uh, uh, semi-private recreational you track, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. I Let's can't see. understand why you have coverage for single family and not covered docks. And the last thing is I do not understand a gentleman across the, the bridge uh, whose father was the lieutenant governor. We spent over $100,000 dealing with trying the planting plan for the first 25 feet. I think a registered landscape architect has that plan. The City arborists should not be able to veto that plan. You should respect professionals that bring you permits, particularly in that 25-foot buffer, and we'd be very careful if you don't overdo that, that regulation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Okay, please. Hi, I'm Barbara Nightingale. I'm with the Department of Ecology. Uh, my address is 3190 160th Avenue Southeast Bellevue. So my role is to help you get through the approval process. So that's what the intention of these comments is, um, are. Okay, so we have made, Ecology has made previous comments and you likely have those on record. And they've, they haven't been fully addressed but they have been considered by the Planning Commission. Um, and the Planning Commission has been diligent in looking at the guidelines and incorporating what they need to into the existing draft SMP that you see there. There's still some, and I'll, I'll be submitting written comments later this week, there's still some issues that are outstanding that could be a problem. One is buffers, where the buffers are, we understand you have a 25 foot, initially the SMP just had a 25 foot setback but we understand you have a 25 foot setback and then you have another 25 foot where the structures are actually the, the amount of impervious surface is limited but w um, a problem for us is the 25 percent of the buffer being vegetated i think that the intention is different than how it could be interpreted so we want more clarification on that on exactly what 25 percent is does that mean you can have the plants in one area and only one quarter of that 25 foot setback and the rest of it is lawn. Um, some clarification there. And the same thing with the 25 foot um, native vegetation in the first five foot of the, the first five foot back in the setback is uh, supposed to be native vegetation. And that's not very big to just have 25% of five feet. I think that's about 18 inches of um, a deep buffer. So, and these are all part important pieces of um, maintaining biological function and building it back in. You start from where you are today and it's to get to know net loss with new development, which there may not be that much of, but when there is new development, that just does not mean you go back and um, plant necessarily plant a buffer unless you want to. Um, of course, that's there should be incentives to encourage people to plant buffers. Um, but this is for new development or mitigation for changes in development. Um, I heard a comment tonight about the community boating facility, the beach club. So that can be, uh, that's separate from single family docks because you're serving a, a number of people. So it's actually a preferred use of a dock. So you can write your, your regulations around that particular dock, which could be different than the kinds of th repair thresholds that we're urging you to consider to kind of get docks um, into compliance with today's standards. So. Um, so and another that could be a problem is your 25-foot setback from wetlands. 
Um, right now, you only have two inventoried you, wetlands you, in Luther Burbank. Your time's right out, but I think okay. it's important that we let you okay. speak. And I'm not going to take long. Yeah, right. please, please. I timed this. I didn't think it was going to be this long. No, you're fine. <laughs> okay. This is good. So you've got two wetlands, and they're at the north and south end of Luther Burbank Park. So, And those are fine. You have good setbacks. In fact, I think the Park Department is actually in planning extending um, setbacks there. So, But the problem is where I see there might be a problem um, is are those new wetlands that might be inventoried and to just set t a 25 foot um, boundary from the boundary of the wetland as a setback isn't consistent with your critical areas ordinance you don't have to incorporate your critical areas ordinance but it's just something you might want to think about um, because you might it might come up to be a category two three four wetland um, your documents show that there isn't a category and there aren't category one wetlands but you have two three and four and 25 feet it doesn't match with your critical areas ordinance for category two and it's the low end for the others so this is just precautionary because right now it's the two wetlands in luther burbank park and they're fine we're not calling those out as a as a problem mr mayor with all due respect this is a three minute comment period Okay. That's fine. Okay, that's Actually, fine. I, if I might suggest, yeah. uh, Mayor Perman, Katie Knight, City Attorney, for the record, um, you might be able to separate. We've had public comment. It might be worthwhile to have because DOE has been a component of this. You can also ask staff questions. So I think if Ms. Nightingale could be available for questions from the council, okay. that that might be a worthwhile use of her time too and, and separate out, and then we'll be able to get her comments. So that, okay. Does that work there. for the council too? Okay. Does that work? Okay. okay. Does that work? Yes. Yeah, okay. Great. We'll do it that okay. way. Thanks, uh, Mike. Okay. Um, we wanted to make sure um, in something of this uh, magnitude it's important that we are fair to all sides of the issue so we just want to uh, be as fair as we can so thank you with that is anyone else like to address the council at this time okay seeing none we're going to close public hearings and we'll bring it back to staff and uh, Tim Well, you've heard a, a number of uh, different comments this evening, many of which would uh, uh, you would benefit from additional staff analysis and discussion. Um, what I would hope is that you would be able to provide us with any other questions or information um, that uh, we might be able to include in the matrix and uh, move forward to the next meeting. On the other hand, we'd be happy to take a shot at uh, any questions you might have now and, and see what we can come up with. Uh, again, let me uh, reemphasize, 29 Planning Commission meetings, thousands of pages of documents, many of the same issues um, that have you've heard of this evening. Planning Commission is fully deliberated, and I think it's important that as we go into the next phase that we be able to draw that deliberation out and provide you with a summary of that to let you know um, what the Planning Commission was thinking in forming their recommendations. One last point is that on many of these issues, uh, Planning Commission looked at and deliberated specific amendments to the development regulations that would address some of the concerns, and after deliberation, the Planning Commission chose not to adopt those amendments. We have those, and we'd be happy to provide those to you as part of the discussion. Okay. Great. Mr. Mayor, Council? just a housekeeping yeah. issue. Sure. How, I noticed Mr. Schaefer from the audience had quite a few comments, and I didn't see that he had a prepared document to give to uh, the city clerk. Can I ask Mr. Schaefer that you communicate those to the city staff? Yeah, I'll talk about it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So at this point, um, Tim, you're opening it up for the council to ask you questions regarding the document and kind of see where that goes from here and and particularly to see if there are issues that you would like us to spend more time right. on fully developing for our next agenda bill which will go out soon okay um, this is the second bite of this uh, that we've had um, Mike Grady uh, missed the last meeting so maybe Mike would you like to start off well indeed thank you and thanks to you Tim for all your fine work and to the Planning Commission I know they've put in many a long hour this is not an easy subject and as my colleagues at ecology and other resource agencies can attest um, the hard stuff uh, continues to be hard um, I've got a number of 
uh, questions, uh, Tim, and uh, issues that I want to raise, and they fall in various categories. The first one deals with best available science and the list of references that you provided to me, and I was concerned when I read through the reports that the Planning Commission apparently made a scientific finding that the, uh, the science on a particularly uh, listed species was inconclusive. Um, I will note uh, for the record that uh, my day job, I work for NOAA Fisheries. And so I come at this with over 15, actually 20 years plus experience in dealing with not only the Growth Management Act, but uh, the Endangered Species Act. As I look through the list of references, it is uh, noticeably uh, deficient in a couple of key areas. One in particular, are there are references to uh, Roger Tabor, who worked as, as a research scientist for Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Roger's done a number of acoustic tracking studies in Lake Washington and most recently uh, working on the 520 replacement project. Um, many of those studies uh, have been uh, completed in the last couple of years and I note that in the report uh, there was a statement made by a member of the Planning Commission that uh, docks don't affect fish behavior. I can say with certainty based on Roger's work and others over the last couple of years that they do in fact <laughs> alter their behavior and they're they're a stressor for the fish so let me back up a little bit Mike maybe uh, if you could ask questions I think it, it's starting to sound oh, it's starting it, to it, debate it's getting it's, a question can you yeah okay zero in on questions and then we'll bring it back like zero yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's <right. laughs> it's rubbing off he's, 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 he's teaching me well um, so my question uh, Tim is Knowing that, you know, we've listed uh, two key species, Chinook and uh, Steelhead, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, for very good reasons, because they're in danger of going extinct. Um, why, then, don't we have the most recent information on fish in this list of references? Specifically, biological, biological opinion that were written uh, for projects on Mercer Island, like the Lake Line, which contains status of species, habitat assessments, and also the most recent work by Roger and his colleagues on fish tracking. Well, I, ha I wasn't around for the entire Planning Commission um, debate, but my understanding is that the Planning Commission received and evaluated those documents that were submitted to it by the various interest groups. And if there are other documents out there that should be or could be included in the record, we'd certainly be willing to do that. Um, you can find all of the literature that's been submitted, uh, again, in the city's webpage, where you can go in and look at, the, uh, look at the title, the author, click on it, and it will bring up the study that's in, in question. And so if, the there, if there are other information that should be added to the record, uh, I'd certainly encourage people to submit it. All right. I'll make sure to do that. Um, on the same subject of the best available science getting to water quality issues, I note that there are, I, I didn't find any uh, references in the uh, related publications and papers that you just referenced that deal with any water quality concerns on the shoreline. But I did note that in the discussion of the updated shoreline master program, we've got, what, 130 plus outfalls, and of those, about 109 are in, within the shoreline. Yes, one of, the, um, one of the things the city is also working on in addition to the SMP is, of course, the NPDES permit, which governs surface water and discharge. And as we looked at uh, those, um, how those integrate, um, that was part of the del deliberation is to keep the uh, NPDES work and the water quality work within the, the water quality uh, regulatory structure and to augment and supplement that with the, uh, the SMP so that they integrate as opposed to overlap and duplicate. Well, yeah, uh, Tim, and per our earlier discussions, as you know, that's kind of a house of cards that will fall upon itself uh, because uh, what I'd request you do is uh, Patrick put together a report as we went through our NPDES updates. Mm -hmm did a fantastic job of identifying uh, the gaps in biological protection uh, because uh, for the record the MPDS permit is not based on best available science it's based on a risk assessment model is that correct uh, I'm not sure of that detail I would like to 
um, make sure everybody understands that the standard for the SMP is not a best available science standard. It had been prior to 2010, but in 2010 the legislature adopted House Bill 1653, which changed that best available science standard to a no net loss standard. That's uh, further described in footnote three on page two of the Planning Commission report. However, and Tim, I would note uh, that uh, in order for it to be uh, tiered to the growth management plan, which it will be, uh, growth management has the best available science requirement. Growth management absolutely does, and one of the challenges that we've had is the integration of the Growth Management Act with the SMP and how we integrate the critical area ordinance with the SMP. Um, that's a fairly complex uh, question that uh, we'd be happy to further describe and discuss um, uh, in more detail. Well, um, so as a placeholder, I, I'd request that you work with Patrick to put as part sure. of the record the report that he did on our stormwater upfalls, which notes that uh, most of the outfalls on the north end are not in compliance with biological thresholds. Uh, the other issue deals with uh, dock width, and I'm curious as to why, knowing that the Corps won't permit docks um, uh, up to eight feet, why did the Planning Commission land on status quo? Um, the thinking of the Planning Commission was that the eight-foot dock is what we have now, and that after evaluating uh, the evidence in front of it, uh, determine that they should stay with the eight feet. Now the two alternatives to that uh, standard of course are to limit it, limit the dock width to six feet either inside or outside the 30 feet or to reduce it to four feet within the 30 and then six foot beyond. That is the Department of Ecology recommendation and uh, that really is going to be a policy issue for the council to deliberate. Well, but is it really a policy issue, Tim? Because uh, the plan, as it's drafted, defers mo most, if not all, of the tough issues to other agencies like Ecology or the Corps slash National Marine Fishery Service. So I'm curious what, to board on on this issue sure. a little bit more, because this is a significant one. Um, why uh, did the Planning Commission hold the line on the eight foot when they knew, based on the record, they knew that the Corps would not permit eight feet, eight foot docks? Um, the Planning Commission uh, thinking was that they uh, would prefer to stay with the uh, larger dock. There was uh, a number of individuals who testified to the eight foot dock. I think uh, the chair last week in front of the council uh, talked about uh, handicapped accessibility as, uh, as one of the issues that they were concerned with. Um, and this is, um, this is a major issue that um, has been debated here and in other communities. And how have the other communities resolved that? Um, it's varied by community. Um, and I, th you know, I think Renton, this is an issue for Renton. And I think, Barbara, maybe you can help me out here. But the um, uh, Renton uh, had proposed a larger dock, and I think they have at least staff at the staff level. Reach, would you uh, talk about Renton perhaps a little bit? So Renton wanted um, wider docks. They wanted six foot. They weren't going to eight feet. Eight feet is not acceptable. Okay, um, but six feet. So and they wanted the six feet for handicap. That was the the safety issues. Mm -hmm. So um, in consideration. What, what the policy with ecology and what we have suggested and we're, so we're going back and forth with um, we've approved their SMP with conditions so now we're working out two conditions and the one is docks and the dock width so ecology stands with the four feet for the first 30 feet because that's based on a biological evaluation that the federal services have and that they've agreed upon for the listed species so and we support that. If, however, 
so and we have allowed so the language allows the new regulations and the regulations that we have given our sign off on is that if approved by the Army Corps of Engineers or Fish and Wildlife um, it can be six feet we don't say eight feet but if approved by so you've got and without a variance so you're not asking for additional permitting um, for a wider dock but you are allowed and there is it that it is important to us to be able to have a normal standard remain at that four feet for the first 30 feet from ordinary high water mark because you've got the the juveniles coming through and they do use it and um, that it does make a difference <laughs> so but <clears throat> so an important piece is the grading so there's things for you to consider as and in, in terms of offsetting that impact um, but so so uh, Barb and Tim my issue here is if we hold the line at eight feet, how do you end up with the no net loss of ecological function? So, and the problem is cumulative effects. What does one eight foot dock do? But what does a lot of eight foot docks do? Right. So that's really. And I'll get the to issue. cumulative effects later right. because the plan does so, not have a cumulative effects analysis. Right. So. Eight feet isn't really acceptable to us in terms of not having impacts, but one of the, you know, to think about it in, like, how could you, it would be through grading. It would be through allowing the light to the submerged vegetation as well as to the animals. But, okay, so, so, so let's follow that through. So okay. you're, for every replacement, you're going to allow an eight foot width. And then you're going to have new docks that go in, and you're going to allow an eight foot width with grading. But you're still going to have overwater shading. So, again, I ask both of you yeah. how do you get up, how do you get to no net loss with that policy? Well, let me first clarify the eight foot standard would only be for new docks. Under the no, it, it also deals with replacement, Tim. Un under the proposal, uh, replacement would be allowed if it right. were legally existing so it well even the non-conforming uses it doesn't speak to the non-conforming uses the it, well it, it if you adopted a rule that put docks into a non-conforming status for example the eight-foot dock that was permitted last year is a legally existing eight-foot dock because that's our current regulation mm -hmm. if the city were to adopt a six-foot standard it would make that dock non-conforming but it would be a legal non-conformity because it had been established under the previous regulations under the proposal that dock could be repaired maintained and completely replaced provided it was approved by the Corps approved by Fish and Wildlife and demonstrated to the city it meant no net loss on a project by project basis so that's what's in front of you and uh, we'd be happy to go into alternatives or uh, an, as much analysis as council would like. Well, my question, because it gets to the policy uh, piece that is in um, attachment A, and, you know, as I look through there, it, I mean, the words sound good, but when you get to the details, they don't comport with the policies. For instance, uh, peers and mortgages on page 50 in number three, you say the repair, renovation, replacement of existing piers and docks should be allowed. And when you bore in on the details, the allowed gets you to repair in kind what you had there. So what you're talking about is you're adding a contingency that if approved by the core and Fish and Wildlife, and that's why I raised this issue right up, right off the bat. The core is not going to let you take an eight-foot dock that you had there and then renovate it and allow you to put an eight-foot dock in again so I get back to the original question what knowing that why do, do we have this hard line on eight foot for the dock and you got kind of a smoke and mirror thing here saying you know we're gonna meet no net loss and all that stuff there's no mathematical way you can end up with no net loss if you hold the line on an eight-foot dock because you've set the baseline with the existing uses, right? Yes. Uh, Planning Commission uh, debated the question of the baseline a lot. What is the baseline? And their conclusion was that the baseline 
was the existing condition that exists out there today. Mm -hmm. If we have an eight-foot dock today, that establishes the baseline. So that, if it didn't change, it wouldn't create a net loss. If it were changed to allow grading, for example, it would create some gain. And that was the, that was sort of the tension um, of the, the discussion. One of the, one of the very important things that um, needs to uh, be discussed is the notion of the integration of the SMP regulation with the federal and state regulations. And the Planning Commission, you know, includes a, a number of developers, number of attorneys, number of people who have used this regulatory structure. And they were very, very concerned about adding additional layers of regulation uh, onto the community. So the, the idea became that the, if the federal or state government had a regulation which required uh, the replacement to be uh, an improvement, then there wasn't the need for the city to add another regulation on top of that. And that theme is pretty consistent through the Planning Commission's recommendation. But, but Tim, that just, it doesn't make any sense be, because it, we're, not, we're adding a provision or a misperception that you can do that. And that's why I raised the question is you can't build an eight-foot dock. It's not going to get permitted. Can, can, Mike, can we just ask the Department of Ecology, I mean, when you say eight foot won't be permitted in this, in this plan, so I think what you're saying is if we send you a, an SMP with eight feet, you're just going to send it back. Right. Okay, so that's... that's. I, I have not, I, I can't officially see it any it. other way based yeah. on the way the response but has been. I guess the, the same question with covered mortgages. As I understand it, that's a non-starter with ecology. So if we send you a SMP with covered mortgages, are you going to, what happens with that? No, that's not necessarily true with the covered mortgages. You have translucent covers, you have no sides. I mean, if, if agencies, we do not like to see covered mortgages, but the agencies are not prohibiting covered mortgages. But we'd want to see the limiting factors, how they impact the habitat um, it, to have sidebars on it. As I've talked with Fish and Wildlife, I've talked with CORE, and yes, they, they both would like to not see more covered moorages. But if there were covered moorages, you've already got the sidebars in what you're proposing. But if the, if the way as I understand the Planning Commission has done it, if it's a replacement of an existing facility, whether it be mm -hmm. a dock or a covered moorage, then the property owner is entitled to replace it exactly as it is now, which could be with sides, no translucent. That's well, unacceptable. So, so that'll come back. That'll come back. Right. So from, so if, as I understand it, so if, if we're going to permit any kind of replacement, we would need to, at a, at a minimum, require that certain construction standards, for lack of a better term, be applied, like translucence and like open sides, or for example, on a covered moorage. And so you might consider that with a percent threshold. So the way the other jurisdictions have done it, you'd, you'd define minor, major uh, repair and replacement, or 30 percent, 50 percent, um, as one where you start to have to, you, you need to replace the, the pieces to come into compliance with the existing SMP standards. So you're saying that even if you do a, because the way that the Planning Commission has done it. They talk about what repair, replacement, and renovation. So I think it's maintenance, repair, and complete replacement. So, mm -hmm. so what is the line between maintenance, repair, and complete? Re if, if for example, you did a thirty percent right. replacement, is that where does that what is that classified as? Yeah, that's exactly the question of what makes it a complete replacement, um, and what makes it a simple repair and that you can draw that line wherever you'd well, like where, to. Where is, where is the Planning Commission drawing the line? Planning Commission has drawn the line, uh, has called a repair and a maintenance and put that in the same basket as a complete replacement. But I understand that, but is, so basically if they put it in the same basket, so right now if from what ecology is telling us is that the way other jurisdictions have, have approached that is to do it on a percentage basis. I, I gather that that's that 
con that thought was not considered by staff or the planning commission? Oh no, it was it was extensively considered, and writing that uh, change to the regulation would be a very simple thing to do. One of the overriding um, uh, thoughts of the planning commission was that uh, the core and uh, the state in their permitting functions are going to regulate many of these <coughs> activities that. that's, and that's, that's the duplication they, they, they felt pretty strongly that the city shouldn't be adding duplicative regulations but now the, if if council wants to go that way we no, can but it, that's, that's, that's Mike's argument about an, an illusion that we're creating here by saying telling someone you can actually completely replace your dock and and under the city nothing's going to happen to you and but um, but worry about the guy behind the the, the curtain because they're gonna they're gonna heavy up on you I mean, well, I, I, it's well it's it, w one of the strong provisions in the regulation is that a clear statement that this regulation does not relieve the applicant of any other federal or state law that. rule that's or regulation you don't you don't need an ordinance to say that I mean that's well, that sometimes people law. need to be reminded. <laughs> Can I please ask, uh, Mr. Mayor, for Mr. Thorpe? Th there seems to be some conflicting information, and I appreciate, Barb, you, you giving the perspective of DOE. If, if I may ask Mr. Thorpe, who ha seems to have uh, experience on the other side of the house, uh, address why he says uh, that we can indeed submit uh, these changes to DOE. They fine, but um, Mr. Thorpe does not represent the city. Well, I don't. I don't think Barb does. Does she? This is a. She's rev the reviewing agency. Is what is happening. She's giving feedback as to what could we anticipate when we put this forward, and it's reviewed, and what could come back to us. Correct. Right. We're yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you've got the you've got CEO, you've got the Corps of Engineers also, and we don't have them there. Right. And we did Fish and Wildlife, and we don't have them there. And you know, you've got uh, the, the issue. You know, I went I went good discussion. You've got the DOE I perspective. Bob, like Bob's function, the though, is the citizen as much as with somebody you know, is, is with people expertise. Right. Maybe what you can do is direct those questions at Tim and his staff, and hopefully they could. Uh, answer those for you. All right, Director Stewart, why did we have prior testimony from a citizen uh, saying that we could indeed make these changes and uh, DOE would would uh, defer to our judgment, I guess is a way to put it. Well, as I, um, as I discussed last time, um, what normally happens is the city advances the draft um, to the Department of Ecology that is then followed by a very detailed and rigorous review of, uh, of, of the proposal. And typically, ecology will come back with required changes and suggested changes. Uh, the city and ecology will then enter into negotiations. And hopefully, at the end, uh, the negotiated settlement or the agreement is acceptable to both parties. And it sounded so, like there was a track record of cities submitting changes to DOE and successfully getting those changes through well that's from what mr. Thorpe testified um, my experience is that um, uh, the cities and Department of Ecology tend to work together to try to solve problems so that that you can get to an agreed-upon solution as I also mentioned last week if the city and ecology do not get to that solution um, then there's some uh, the ecology has some pretty strong authority in what what it may do, um, and then you move into a whole different world of lawyers. But is there a fairly uh, decent success rate of cities going to DOE with changes and those changes being accepted? Um, I, you know, I I wouldn't want to try to handicap that. If I can continue yeah. down the list, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tim, for engaging here. Um, the issue of mitigation uh, comes up uh, frequently during the plan, but it's not very well articulated in terms of how you do that and when you do that and where you could do that. Um, so specifically, let's suppose I, I'm going to build a new dock. I need to offset those 
functions that will be lost by putting the overwater structure and any other hardened um, structures on the shoreline. Um, how would I mitigate those impacts if I haven't avoided and minimized them? So I've tried to avoid, I've tried to minimize, so I've gone through the sequencing, I'm at mitigation. How would I do that? Um, the, the, for a, a dock, the regulations outline a set of standards which are principally based on the RGP3 standard and presume that if you meet these uh, issues, if you meet all of those standards, there will be no net loss of ecological function. Um, if you do not meet the standards, if you want to build a bigger dock or you want to do something that is outside of that uh, standard, then you would be required to get approval of uh, Army Corps, approval of Fish and Wildlife, and demonstrate to the city through analysis, uh, submittal of biological assessments, that the proposal met the no net loss standard. That's the current construct of the current ordinance. Right, but um, it, again, so we've, we've got impacts to functions with mm -hmm. this hypothetical project. Uh, they haven't been able to avoid, they haven't been able to minimize, so now we're asking them to mitigate. How do they do that? Where do they do that? The mitigation uh, yeah. issue, um, uh, the regulations state that mitigation is preferred on site, but is also allowed off site. So if you had a situation where there was a mitigation uh, that was required and there was no reasonable or practical way to do that on site, uh, it might be possible to do, to buy into or contribute to or be part of. Uh, an enhancement project, for example, in Luther Burbank Park or at one of the street ends. Um, the devil, of course, would be in the detail of establishing the amount, the quality, the impacts, the, all, of, all of the things that go into a <coughs> successful mitigation plan. All right, so I'm glad you raised Mike, it. I Mike, can I uh, offer something for a minute? Um, it sounds like we want to discuss this just quite a bit more on this, is that right? I'm, and I'm actually near the end. Okay, because let me let me ask this and then see if this works. We have two agenda items here, and we have people in the audience waiting, uh, and uh, they're the open space. I, I see Debbie's up there, and some of the staff. And maybe if we could just handle those and then come back to this, would that work for people? So we can. Okay, because okay. So why don't we do that? We're going to put this on hold for right now. And uh, Tim, uh, you're with us for a while longer. We'll okay. be here for and, as long as you want. Yeah. And then why don't we move then to Agenda Bill 4624, it's the Open Space Conservancy uh, Annual Trust, and uh, Debbie Berlin, who's the new chair, uh, would like to come forward. Great. Well, I wanted to say thank you very much for the chance to be here tonight and to present the um, council annual plan. It's a privilege to be here. It's also an interesting situation because, as most of you know, I was appointed to the council in December. So I'm actually reporting on the great work that my colleagues have been doing. And in particular, um, I wanted to call out the great work, I think, for the last three years of the former chair, which is Don Cohen. He's been chair 2008, 2009, 2010. So I'm going to attempt to do some small justice to some of the work that he's led. Um, at the same time, I think he's received great support from the council. Most recently, the trust has felt the support and enthusiasm, the importance of Pioneer Park and Engstrom through the budgeting process, through the great works of our liaison, which is Dan Grouse. It's clearly been communicated and, and tangible and I think in unofficial ways as well. I'd also like to thank very much the staff that has been supporting the trust in the few months that I've been on the trust, the lone chair. I think um, the enthusiasm and the dedication and the orientation to detail has been truly impressive. So I'd just like to recognize those people for making this possible. Um, this past year I think has been a, a very strong year. I think there's been a lot of continued momentum in terms of uh, taking the park forward. And when I look at what's been accomplished, I see there's four basic areas of activity which I hope are of interest to the council and also to the general citizenry. The first area is the attempt and the interest, the commitment to expanding 
the audiences that feel that the park is a relevant resource. And I think that's um, embodied by the fact there's been a lot of letterboxing activities. Elliot Newman, uh, one of the trustees, has been very active in establishing that both last year and again this year. Um, there's been work on the accessibility elements of the park, particularly the perimeter trail around the northwest quadrant, and also some initial discussions that have taken place between the um, parks organization and Sunny Bean Preschool to see how we can start to bring some small children and start to develop their appreciation and understanding for Pioneer Park and Angstrom. So I think those are some examples of, again, the attempt and the hope to create an expanded awareness, expanded audience for this resource. Um, the second area, of course, is the responsibilities we have for ensuring the continued and even enhanced improvement in health of the forest itself. We've been working under the guidance of the Forest Health Plan, which was established, I believe, in January of 2010, if I've got that correct. The focus there has been on reducing invasives, significant tree planting, and the herbicide protocol. I think we've been uh, supported, and a lot of the work has been facilitated, even accelerated by a very strong bidding environment, which has allowed some of the wor work to progress not only faster, but also to extend into um, a longer maintenance cycle for some of the activities, which will ensure, I hope, the longevity of um, a number of the, the planting processes. Um, the third area that I want to call out was, again, in line with that first category, which is to expand the audience, is also to improve the usability of the park. And I think that's been represented quite strongly by work that's going on right now and will hopefully be embodied this summer through the kiosk area, the improvements proposed there in terms of some seating, um, some revegetation, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some work there that makes the park a more inviting and hopefully um, enjoyable place, not only for individuals, but for small groups as well. The second point, again, would go back to the development of the perimeter trail. Again, trying to improve that such that we can have um, some people with physical limitations more easily enjoy certain portions of the park. And then, of course, there's the addition of the Engstrom Loop Trail that was completed this past year. So there's been great work, and we can now reach into that, that new part of the land that falls under the trust purview. I think the final point that I would raise is that the trust does take quite seriously the professional management responsibilities that we've been given. We're focusing not only on ensuring that we are complying with current budget, but also doing some forecasting work trying to understand what can be done this year, next year, and in years to come to maintain and, if possible, even accelerate um, some of the enhancements and improvements to the park. So again, um, just those four areas, I would say, pretty much represent how we're prioritizing our work. We'll continue to do so. And um, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been short, but it's been a pleasure and a true honor to be on the Conservancy Trust. So I'm open to any questions or comments. Well, thank you. Uh, Council? I saw the note about herbicide, so I can uh, use Roundup on my yard without feeling guilty if you guys are endorsing that. I don't dare comment on that. That's what it said on, in the on agenda your, packet. On your, on your, your <laughs> private property, I'm sure we would have an opinion if you wanted to bring it into the park. <laughs> How far away from the lake line? Uh, shore line? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bruce? Uh, thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, the bridge, I was curious about the uh, hit it took. It's uh, okay at this point? I believe it is structurally sound. I don't know if Paul, you Paul's, want to comment Paul's jumping up. any of the specifics there. It, it's, it's reopened. Yes. Yeah, we, uh, Paul West, Natural Resources Coordinator, we had it um, inspected by a structural engineer and a geotech, and it's fine. Great. And the, the herbicide, I... Uh, had noted long ago the uh, test plots you'd put in and saw that it looked like the ivy was gone within those, but I'm curious, can you can you summarize in a few words where we landed in terms of whether herbicide does make sense to be used or not? We're currently, we currently have not yet used uh, uh, glyphosate herbicide on ivy. We've been using it on Lamiastrum, which is yellow archangel, which is a new invasive in the park that we're trying to nip in the bud, kind of the same idea as the knotweed issue. Um, and then on invasive trees, holly and laurel, 
um, we're, we're doing a direct um, application of Roundup on those. Um, so that's that, that's what we've been doing so far. I'm not sure that we're going to get to a place where we're going to be applying um, Roundup on any kind of widespread basis. I mean, we're not, and, and then the actual news to answer uh, Council Member Sarah's question is we're actually not using Roundup on anything except very, um, very specific uh, frilling applications on tree, on these invasive trees. When we're spraying the herbicide, we're using Aquamaster, which is actually a m even more benign uh, formulation of glyphosate, which is the same thing as Roundup, but it, this has been shown to not impact um, amphibians and other um, aquatic species. So um, that's this, this is why we have the herbicide protocols, because we're, we're really trying to use best available science to make sure we're doing the least harm. I, uh, I also wanted to add, um, I see you got an outreach and education element here, but you don't mention uh, my son's sixth grade class at IMS. I know the teachers had, or teachers, several teachers have had all the kids adopting trees or at least identifying trees as their tree for the year and out there uh, visiting that tree several times during the course of the year and so, uh, and, and doing a bit of uh, invasive removal in the area too. So I think that's, that's another great thing that's going on, but I applaud all your outreach efforts in that regard. And as I get out in the park, I, I continually see improvements in new plantings and new removals of invasives, and I, I say, good job. Thank you for doing that. It's, it looks great. I think that's Jim and his meetings in the park. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing thing is no one's calling me and asking for advice anymore or consultation. We do have boards and commission <laughs> vacancies that we are right now filling, so more interviews. Paul and... Debbie, uh, thank you again uh, for all your hard work, and uh, I miss uh, being on that group because it was always uh, a pleasure to be able to see some results, and particularly working with Earth Corps. Um, and I know I've asked you this recently, Paul, but if you can give us an update, too, on the f spread of the fungus issue and what's your assessment of how we can deal with that, if at all? The, you mean the root rot, root rot. Uh, tree root rots? Yeah, we are... Um, um, we continue to have progression of root rot in, especially in the southeast quadrant, but in other quadrants too. Um, we're tr we're going to be uh, developing and learning a new uh, testing protocol from a consultant uh, who is specializing in, in this particular kind of root rot um, this year. Uh, so that should help us predict where the root rot is and, and anticipate um, uh, its spread which will help us control it a little bit better. Um, it's not something we'll ever stop, but I think that if, um, if we can get ahead of, get, get ahead of it and, and slow down its progression, that will, that will really buy us a lot of time. Right. Debbie, thanks for stepping up uh, to that job. That's great. Uh, Paul, a uh, question I have. I heard a new term from one of the citizens, uh, native plants or native compatible plants. Can you speak to that? You know that um, I don't know what that particularly means. I I can say that there are landscape plants that are not invasive or particularly ingress aggressive, um, so that might I, that might be what they're referring to. But I, I would have to see the document to understand the context of that that phrase. Questions? No. Great. Well, thank you very much. You did a great job on your first time out. I guess Bruce needs, yeah. I, I just want I just want to give everybody else a bite first, but uh, the, the only last comment I want to make is really to the public and not to you, but uh, it's a great time to get out in the park. The trilliums are in bloom these days, or at least they were last time I was there a few days ago, and I encourage everybody to get out and visit their local park and uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the flowers that are coming up. And it also should be pointed out that uh, the secretary of the trust is here also, Mr. Thorpe. So you wore three hats tonight. I think they wanted me to be the sergeant of arms. <laughs> we'll leave it at three. <laughs> so, and thanks for coming. Good. I, I do want to let you know that both Debbie and Bob asked something of me, and both of them were required to pull Ivy. So uh, they both given time. So, But with that, thank you so much for the report, and uh, thank everyone else on the uh, trust. Would you please? Okay.
Okay, uh, let's move on then with uh, Parks and Recreation's Recreation Special Events Funding Report. Okay. Yeah. For the record, Diane Mortensen, Recreation Superintendent. Good evening, Council Members. I'm here this evening to give you an update on the Parks and Recreation Department's fundraising efforts to save a number of special events and programs in our community. At the December 6, 2010 City Council meeting, Parks and Recreation Director Bruce Fletcher pledged for the Parks Department to raise the proposed budget cut of $28,000 through donations, grants, sponsorships, and fees. The City Council approved this request and it asked that we report back with an update this spring. I'm happy to report that our residents and community organizations have been very supportive and we have raised just over $16,000 to date. This includes a $2,500 Rotary Club grant, a $2,500 Community Fund grant, $5,000 Preschool Association grant, $1,260 from the Women's Club, a $500 donation from Friends of Luther Burbank, a $500 donation from Cascade Kendo Kai, and $4,000 in private don donation and user fees. We will be continuing our fundraising efforts for the remainder of the year and through 2012. We're asking the community for their support. Donations can be made online through PayPal by going to our website, miparks.net. I'm also pleased to report that the Adventure Playground, after its first year, has received state and national recognition. In October of 2010, the City of Mercer Island received Playmaker of the Month by Kaboom, a national nonprofit that provides communities with tools and resources and guidance to build and renovate playgrounds and play spaces. An Adventure Playground article was also published in the Washington Recreation and Park Association WRPA magazine and the National Recreation and Park Association magazine. And last Thursday evening at the WRPA conference, we were presented with one of the best youth program awards for the Adventure Playground. We look forward to the opportunity to continue to serve and offer a variety of special events and programs for our community through this biennium and many years to come. And with that, are there any questions? Great, Great report. Thanks. Questions? It says it all. <laughs> um, this sounds like great progress. I, I'm curious from a staff perspective, uh, how much, how difficult has it been to, to get the momentum going on this? And, and what I'm, what I'm after here is so, you know, Bruce, you, you took the onus upon yourself, you know, passed it on to staff, of course. But uh, how, uh, <laughs> how, uh, how much, how much, uh, how, how difficult has it been to do this, and, and to what extent is it consuming a lot of staff time to, to um, you know, get to where we are. Sure. And I can I can answer that. And if Bruce has something to add, um, I think most of the staff time <laughs> has been through grant writing, which we're not grant writer experts, but we um, the grants that we have written for have been simple and community grants. And so the time aspect of that, you're duplicating the same grant, putting it out there to different organizations. Not a ton of time. Um, the buy-in from the community has been has been good. We just put up on Channel 21 a um, advertisement that loops every 15 minutes, asking for donations as well. Um, but we're also passing the hat, taking the donation box out, and so it's just getting the awareness out through advertising on our website um, and postcards and flyers and constant contact emails and things like that. Bruce Fletcher, uh, Parks Director. Yes, the staff has done a wonderful job, and I only committed to 25000 We're going to get it still, I promise. Um, for an example, um, Mr. Cyril, you were probably at that lunch in the Rotary. I brought the box in. I said, you know, we're trying, even though Rotary already gave us $2,500 donation, I said, this is not for the Rotary. This is for your guys' wallets. And I, got, I walked out of there with $403, and then a day later on PayPal, we picked up another couple hundred dollars. It's, it comes and goes. It's not easy, but we have a great message to, to convince to people, and they've been stepping it up. We're looking at other ways in the future where potentially maybe we could do a 5K fun run each year. That way we'd have a program in place that would go right to our special events. But we're all, the staff has really stepped up, a lot of different incredible ideas. The energy has been good. Started out a little bit slow, and, and the great thing about Diane and her crew is they're making sure they're not spending more than they're getting in, so they're right on target. 
Council, what's important about their success that they've had so far is, if, I guess it's twofold. Um, we have to do this two years in a row because we passed a biennial budget that presumed um, the reduction in funds for the uh, these programs and also the fireworks. The other thing that's important about it is that we needed to make a decision one way or the other if we were going to do these programs by about now, um, April, May, because the staff people that were responsible for them only had partial funding for their job up till about now. And we, we need to be able to project in the future, are we going to have enough money to keep this whole thing going, keep the, the staff in place? And, and I think what you're hearing is the answer is yes. Uh, we can do that. We can also, with some certainty, I think, uh, assume that we can do this fundraising again next year to keep this going. So it, it's a bit of an experiment. We've never been in this place before where we had to go out and raise money to do ongoing programs. But at least for biennium, this biennium, I think we'll be able to do that. Uh, with the fireworks, as, as you heard earlier from Chris and Benson, uh, we need to get, a, and well, Diane knows this, we need to get a commitment to the barge fireworks people next yeah. month, this month. Yeah, basically now, but we're looking really good for the fireworks. So, so we think already. we can get there, but we needed to make these commitments here in the spring so that we can even do these summer programs. And uh, I, I've been absolutely delighted that they've been able to do this and still keep up the rest of their work. And with the recent news tonight, I would really like to talk after the meeting to Councilmember Grady, because I believe he said he could raise $18,000 an hour and a half, so I'm going to pick him up on that. <laughs> 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 I think we put the fireworks. I think we put the Chihuahua yeah. fireworks onto the barge and uh, <laughs> apply for the permit that could be with Thank you. Great. Well, listen. Thank you so much for your work. And I, I think it says a lot uh, in talking to the other communities. We've all been uh, last couple of years just pounded by this recession, and um, we made a lot of cuts and a lot of tough decisions. And um, it's pretty uh, special that our staff and the city has come forward, and they've come and they said no. We're going to figure out a way to keep things that are special to us, and we're doing it. And at the same time, we've we've kept our bond rating really high. This city is extremely well managed financially. Um, wow! I, I hope people who are watching or listening understand what a great job everyone's doing and how we're we're actually going through this recession. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Question. Yeah. Uh, Jim and Rich, uh, for our um, planning session on, what is it, the 18th of June, um, are we going to have a discussion about, I'm assuming we're going to have a discussion about where we are financially, but there yes. will probably be some savings that we'll be discussing. Uh, are the departments going to bring to us uh, their ideas on how we could allocate those savings, S you know, specifically things that we've talked about here tonight with parking? Um, we will have a, a financial component to the, the the planning session, including a, a forecast. So we always give you a forecast mid-year, um, and we can certainly lay out for you what we haven't spent and what we have. Um, I, I frankly, I wasn't contemplating coming up with a separate list of dollars and projects to go reallocate dollars because, frankly, I don't think we have much. I mean, we're, we are, this is a bare bones budget and we're implementing it as adopted. Uh, you, you could I understand, but you know, where we do have savings, uh, you know, it, we've, made some, we've made some tough cuts and, you know, I think our commitment is where we've cut and, and if we have savings that we go well, back to look at where we've cut, well, like with some of these programs. Well, but that balanced the budget. That was the issue. We had to cut and make those savings in order to balance the budget. It's not like we took those dollars and set them aside so we can reallocate them to something else. It's simply, it's a balanced budget with, uh, because of those savings. I think I'm having a flyby with you once we, again. We, we, um. we, let's talk, we can <laughs> talk about it yeah. tomorrow if you like. I, uh, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. With that, um, let us go back then um, to the Shoreline Master Plan, if we could. And Diane, thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks to everybody. Bruce, keep running. Do you want to take a break? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, Mike, I think we you were speaking. Yeah. Ready to go.
Barb still here? Well, Thank back you. in here. <laughs> All right, so um, Tim, you know what I've tried to lay out are various questions where I think we've got some exposure uh, in terms of some of these issues. Uh, so we've talked about the science issues. I will get to you uh, the stormwater science, the uh, updates on Roger, Roger Tabor's work, uh, a lot of biological opinions, et cetera, uh, to augment uh, the list of references that you have. Uh, but a couple of things that have been raised in comment letters and various uh, other pieces of testimony, and, and it has to do with some internal consistencies between policies mm -hmm. and uh, implementation. Um, and specifically, as you know, as I'm reading through the policy, uh, the PC recommendation exhibit four. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it talks about recognizing the Chinook Conservation Plan and all that good stuff, and it all sounds really good. But uh, when you get to the, some issues like number five, increased public access to publicly owned page, page, page forty-three. Yeah. You know, the various page Great. numbering schemes here, but it's Exhibit Four. Yep, got page it. 40. The exhibits, by the way, should be in numerical order, so that <laughs> yeah. um, we can only we. We'll have that only one page 43. That, that's a good idea to do that. Um, so uh, number five in the middle of the page there where it talks about increased public access to publicly owned areas of the shoreline. All right, so I raised that. Where we left off was the question on mitigation. So you got a project that's not going to be the known net loss mm -hmm. provision, and they need to mitigate. And my question to you is um, how would they do that? What process do we have in place to identify the functions that have been lost and where they can find those lost functions somewhere either on site or on the island? Do we have such a process? Um, not a standardized process, not a program, not a institutionalized process. Um, we have, I think, on one wetland permit, worked out an off-site mitigation with an improvement project in Luther Burbank Park on an ad hoc basis, um, and that would be what would would be envisioned under the SMP for any offsite mitigation. Yeah, and Tim, that this is why I raised the issue because when you look at number f that number five, increase pu increase public access to publicly owned areas of the shoreline, you've got an internal inconsistency with this mitigation idea at our facilities. So let me describe to you. Uh, so if I'm a private landowner, I need to mitigate, and I come to you and you say, well, we've got a project on Luther Burbank where you can contribute. Um, my question is how much would they contribute, what functions would they gain, and we also have this overlying policy in the plan that says in our publicly owned areas we want to increase access, which is counter to trying to, in, you know, conserve, restore, enhance functions. Yeah, I think that um, the uh, public access issue is one of the overarching goals of the SMP, and that's why it is in here. Right. Um, I think when we look carefully at Mercer Island's situation, uh, we have uh, about as much public access as we're probably ever going to have. We have it in the parks, we have it at the street ends, and we have plans in place to improve and enhance many of those small publicly owned properties. I don't know that there's going to be a significant increase in the amount of shoreline access uh, on private property. In fact, I don't think there probably isn't going to be. Uh, uh, so when we look at, uh, when the submittal goes into Department of Ecology, um, you can, uh, that fact that we do provide public access on publicly owned property and that what we want to do is enhance the environment around those access points. Um, Luther Burbank, for example, has a master plan that has a number of uh, environmental enhancement projects that are proposed in it. And one of the uh, uh, augmentations to the program in front of us might be to add that specific master plan as an element of our restoration plan to demonstrate, though, to identify those specific uh, improvement opportunities. Right. But again, the caveat is uh, if you're going to mitigate, one, we need a clear understanding of what the functions, loss, functions gained sure. are. We need to understand what the 
credit uh, algebra is, right. you know, how are we figuring that out? And two, if we're doing it on our own property, we're going to have to fence it off or prohibit access in order to maintain those functions over time because that becomes then our responsibility to maintain those functions in perpetuity. Without taking the, without, with you still having the floor, I have a question about a comment that you made. Now, Councilmember Grady talked about restoration. I thought on the footnote three with HB 1653, the legislature made the shift from restoration to no net loss. Uh, well, it's from the standard under the critical area ordinance, which was best available science that's under the GMA. Under the Reconciliation Act, or when they tried to put those two together, the standard became no net loss of ecological uh, functions within the shoreline area. So um, it, it does get a little bit confusing about what those terms mean and what the basis for, uh, of them should be. From a shoreline management program perspective, it's no net loss. Mm -hmm. That's it's correct. not restoration. So I ask you in all sincerity, should we as a council be looking at this shoreline management program from what the legislature HB 1653 set out, i.e. no net loss, or or the old standard that of, of restoration? Well, my hope would be that over the next 20 years, which is what the period for evaluation by ecology will be, is that we will have enough of the um, enough positive impacts on the environment uh, that it will offset the negative potential loss. And um, some of the uh, positive things uh, that we haven't talked about that Councilmember Grady has asked for are the list of positive attributes that are in the proposed document um, that will help us to meet that overall no net loss over the planning period. Let me give you one of those, and that is that if you are rolling back, if you're getting rid of your bulkhead and you're, you're restoring it with a soft shoreline with woody debris and vegetation, that permit process is very, very, very easy so that uh, you don't have to uh, go through a lot of work. You can, uh, you can uh, get your permit very easy. And if that rollback to a soft shoreline function uh, moves the high water mark back onto your property, you, have a, you are not penalized by the loss of the property. So there's a hold harmless provision that if you're moving water further on your property, you don't move the setback line further on your property. There's a hold harmless. Those are two of the provisions that I uh, would think that as people into the future start looking about whether they're going to replace a bulkhead or soften the shoreline by creating a beach area or other improvements, those are two provisions that I hope would encourage that behavior over the next 20 years. Yeah, Tim, and, and I think those are great. I really do. Uh, you know, to what extent we can move to the uh, soft shorelines, we, sh we should do that. Um, let me get back, though, to the mitigation component because it is a – it needs some work. <laughs> I'll try to be as diplomatic as I can about it. Um, because, you know, what I would look for as a reviewer are three things. Um, substance, certainty, and monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, substance meaning you got the function algebra mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. So if I'm losing riparian functions, that they're replaced by riparian functions somewhere else. Uh, certainty that those functions are going to be maintained over time. So we're taking on a burden here when we have to mitigate and we're going to our property that we're going to end up being responsible for maintaining monitoring that project you know whatever that wherever that mitigation is forever uh, so the monitoring is, is a big deal um, so let's get back to the functions I the one the other thing I didn't see was some function inventory or assessment in the plan uh, so that if I'm a developer and I want to uh, mitigate off-site where, where do I go to get that information and how do I access it well, we have done the uh, the inventory in um, 
Uh, is that one of the attachments? Um, inventory is on uh, attachment five, I think, which is the uh, restoration plan, but that also includes the uh, inventory of the um, of the island where the various uh, functions are. Um, yeah, but you know it's basically a kind of a qualitative description of various parks and things. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Groveland Beach is mentioned as a site, and Tim, I can't think of any inch of the shoreline at Groveland that would qualify for riparian mitigation, for instance. Well, I think we have to make a distinction between riparian uh, areas and the shoreline. Um, one of the things that uh, was mentioned earlier is that the shoreline is not a critical area under growth management. What would be a critical area would be a geological hazard area or any wetland within the shoreline jurisdiction. Well, no, I, we're, I, we're mixing terminology here. Okay. So if you want to mitigate, it doesn't matter whether it's a critical area or not, you're mitigating for a function. Mm -hmm. So in, in order for me to find a function at Groveland Beach, for instance, so if I build a dock on my property, my shoreline property, and I need to mitigate that overwater coverage or hardened uh, shoreline somewhere, I can't do it at Groveland Beach, for instance, because there's nowhere, th there's no shoreline for me to be able to do that. Same thing would hold true at Clark Beach. So you've got descriptions of areas that are potential restoration sites that could be used for mitigation, but in fact, they really are not. And so my, my question to you is, do we have more detail in terms of where, in fact, do we find those functions that we can use for mitigation? Um, well, I guess it's important to realize that the off-site mitigation is not a requirement. It is an opportunity. And um, that line in the regulations about allowing off-site mitigation is after you have exhausted on-site mitigation. Right. Um, and is not an entitlement. You're not entitled to do that. It's required to go through a process and uh, negotiations and demonstrations and what's the values, how much is, how all of the questions that you've raised would have to be part of uh, any approval related to off-site mitigation. Right, but does not the Shoreline Master Program require you to uh, uh, develop a compensatory mitigation program? Um, on site, I mean, you have to avoid, minimize, mitigate. I mean, the sequencing is pretty clear. It's a question of where the physical location of where the mitigation, any mitigation that would be required, where that would be. And okay. it's preferred that it be on site, but not doesn't close the door to a potential off-site mitigation if it makes sense, meets all the standards you've talked about, and is adequately funded and monitored and all of those things. Okay. Uh, we'll get back to that later. Um, cumulative effects. I didn't see a cumulative effects analysis in the... There was a cumulative um, impact analysis that was done very early on by the watershed company, I think, uh, submitted to submitted to Department of Ecology? Not yet. Um, that cumulative impact assessment will need to be done um, after we know what the program is. It would make little sense to spend a lot of staff time and resource doing a cumulative impact analysis if the council chooses to move to a, 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 a four and a six foot dock standard or whether we keep with an eight foot standard. Right. But there is a lot of, um, a lot of that information was presented to the planning commission. They evaluate a lot of it. Um, and so we've got a good first start on it, but we don't know how that's ultimately gonna, that'll depend on what you guys decide to recommend. Okay. Uh, lastly, and thanks for um, allowing me to continue, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the issue of toxins uh, in the water. Um, on page 50 of the, the PC recommendations, Exhibit 4, 
Uh, we've got a policy on the bottom there which speaks to uh, property owners who repair, renovate, or replace existing piers and docks should be provided information on the best materials and methods for environmental enhancement. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, I I'll ask some specific things. One is, um, are we allowing uh, creosote pilings? Are we allowing um, tar uh, type products to be used in the water? Um, are we allowing ACZA coating of pilings? Um, if I could draw your attention to page 23. Of the same document? Of Well, they're all, it's just page 23. There's only one number per page. So this is, I think, exhibit one, page 23. Um, right. Just to set the context on the previous page, page 22, these are the standards, the development standards under 6A for a new dock. And under this standard, uh, you see that there's square footage standards, there's uh, vegetation standards. Um, interesting note on the data, you'll, you'll note that uh, under this standard, um, a single property would only be entitled to a 480 square foot dock. Mm -hmm. The current average dock size on Mercer Island is slightly less than 800 feet. So the, the norm or the standard that we're dealing with is much greater than that. On the next page, page 23, uh, there are standards are continuing. <clears throat> and I think the one you're referring to is standard uh, 6 and then standard seven. 7, right? which outline the specific standards that would be required to, for a new dock. How about the replaced dock? Um, now, now we go to uh, the alternate development standard on page 24. And what that under B on page 24 top says is that if you do not meet these standards, you can apply for an alternative development standard, which would, meet, which would need the three things I've talked about, fish and wildlife approval, Army Corps of Engineer approval and uh, no net loss demonstration to the city. Um, clearly, the Army Corps of Engineers is not going to approve the creosote, the, the old stuff. And if that is a concern on repair replacement that, and, and or alternate standards, we could very easily take that portion, those, those portions on page 22, and move it into some threshold or trigger for repairs and or some minimum standards on alternate development standards. I mean, we can do that. Uh, Planning Commission, again, I think chose not to do that because of the, the over-regulation, the duplicative nature of saying something that we know that the Army Corps is never going to approve. So, but if we wanted to take that step, uh, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, uh, amendment to, to add that if that's where the council wants to go with it. Well, uh, you know, the, as you know, the reason why those toxins have, have been identified is because they're not only harmful to humans but also to fish, and they're acutely toxic to fish. <coughs> so uh, I think it gets back to the same issue like the eight foot dock. I mean, you know, a part of our job is to have full disclosure for the applicant and to what extent we can just sit you know, have regulations that are consistent with what we know is going to be approved. That seems to be to be. And that more certainly is an option for the council. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. That's that's all that I've got for now. I appreciate uh, your engagement. Thank you. Let's start on page 46 of Exhibit 4. I'm actually piggybacking a bit on what Mike just talked about. I'm into the uh, urban park environment. Councilmember Bassett, can you please speak in your microphone? Sorry, thank you. The urban park environment section of the um, uh, document. You know, as I as I looked at this, I thought about our uh, two things. One, we have play fields, parks, and open spaces, which is going to reflects a range of uses mm -hmm. of of open land on the island, and. 
And then I also thought about the work we did to restore the shoreline of Luther Burbank and all the effort that went into creating uh, a few beaches, but a lot of um, uh, habitat yes. along that shoreline. And yet what I see here in this urban park environment seems to be all directed at uh, human beach activity. And so I, what I, my, th my thought immediately was, does it not make sense to have another section here that represents a beach open space sort of uh, aim which we might logically have for the sections of our parks that we're not trying to maximize the um, human impact on but instead the, the uh, restorative effects yes very very good question um, and in order to try to answer it I'd like to um, make sure that the policies that are um, in here there and we have two classifications of shoreline we have the residential urban residential and we have the urban park environment and I'd like to point you to exhibit three exhibit two I'm sorry which is uh, page what what would that be 29 um, if we go to that map these policies were constructed to apply in the two different shoreline designations and more importantly the regulations were also structured into these two different classifications so as you can see um, clearly Luther Burbank is uh, clearly identifiable Clark Beach is clearly identifiable but then also uh, look at the very small little street ends so these policies would apply to any of the areas within the green on the island but as you can see, the vast majority of the island is urban residential. So when we look at uh, the policies here, then we sh the next step would be to look at the specific regulations within those two designations um, and look to perhaps the master plans for those parks. Again, I think it would add value to the proposal to take the adopted master plan for Luther Burbank and include it in here which would provide a further level of detail about what areas are prime for restoration what areas are going to be set aside for public access you know I know the point out there we've got a serious erosion problem and there's a real opportunity out there to do something um, something good in conjunction with the wetland complex perhaps um, so those are the kinds of uh, um, improvements that would happen over the 20 years that I hope would be a very important element of, of this. Wait, I guess what I'm, as I look at this, and this is a good, this is a, the map is a good spot to have the conversation from. I, I think Mike's points that Groveland and Clark Beach are really uh, focused on you know, what I would think of as urban park environment is, is, is accurate, but only fractions of Luther Burbank are. And so yes. does, it, does it perhaps make sense to have uh, Luther Burbank actually subdivided into sections uh, for the purposes of this map, uh, such that it's urban park in some sections and it's um, beach open, it's, it's uh, natural waterfront yeah. something or other in other sections especially in the areas where the where the wetlands are which clearly we're not going to turn into uh, so, some communities know. have um, have done um, uh, smaller divisions of reaches uh, the, the extent of this is natural this is beach this is dog park this is whatever the the thing is I'm not sure that um, including it in in uh, this um, would add value. Right. More importantly, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, point you to the use regulations um, that are uh, that govern what can and cannot happen in the park, and that would be on page twenty, uh, page eleven, ten and eleven. And uh, again, these are uh, these are regulatory standards which would prohibit activities um, and then also allow activities so this this table of uses on landward outlines on page 10 which activities are NP not permitted which activity are categorically exempt which activities are permitted that would be the P 
And which activities would require a shoreline conditional use permit? Very rigorous uh, uh, process with ecology's ultimate approval. Um, and that's true for the landward shoreline uses and also the waterward on page 11. This is really where the distinction between the urban residential and the urban park environment hits the ground. This is where the differences are between those two designations. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. You, would, let, me, let me take one more crack at it. I'm over on page 47 yep. uh, of section 4, or exhibit 4. And I'm within now um, management policies and looking at management policy number three, which is public access and pub public recreation objectives should be implemented whenever feasible. And uh, I'm thinking to myself that that's not necessarily the aim that I want for an area that's currently wetland or has been um, identified as an area where we're trying to um, uh, restore ecological function on the shoreline. Sure. So it, it feels to me like this urban park environment title lumps uh, and then it lumps these different sections of Luther Burbank and then sets a standard for them which doesn't allow us to uh, identify an intent to preserve some areas for ecological function. So that's that's where I'm going with that. It's really a separate issue from the residential, mm -hmm. urban residential, gotcha. uh, and it's it, it's not aimed at the at the user friendly beaches of Luther Burbank. I'm trying to separate out and, and call our attention to the the areas that we're uh, having the intent of preserving. Yes, I, I, I see what you're getting at. Um, one of the ways of looking at this is to look at all four of the management policies and understand that there is a balancing that's going on. For example, in number one, um, uses that preserve natural character of the area or promote preservation of open space or sensitive lands, either directly or over the long term, should be the primary allowed use. So there is this tension, this balance within the policies and those ultimately play out in two ways. One is the regulations, which govern what you can, can and cannot do. And the other one is the restoration plan of what we want to do over the long term in terms of providing or meeting the balance of all of these management policies. So in the next sentence, though, I see use, uses that will result in restoration of ecological function should be allowed. And I think to myself, well, not just allowed, but encouraged. It's not uses exactly, it's it's restorations, for instance. That, so. This shouldn't con contradict the um, the master plan of Luther Burbank Park. Well, I, yeah, I guess that, that ends correct. up being the, mm -hmm. and, and what you're saying is use Luther Burbank Park's master plan yes. as, the, as the government. I, I think that that would be a valuable addition to put that into as an uh, okay. attachment to the restoration plan. That uh, because that really is the nugget. I mean, that's the that's the gold ring of trying to get the restoration done over the next twenty years. A lot of that may may very well happen at Luther Burbank Park. All right, I'm I'm beating this one to death. So let me move <laughs> let me move on. Um, let's do docs uh, docs for a moment. So um, Mike knows the, the the science around this. I don't know the science, Barbara. Maybe you can help. I what I'm looking for is a layman's understanding of I, I don't want to talk six foot eight foot four foot right now I want to understand what's driving our what's our intent here and what factors are matter in fish fish behavior can you summarize and if if, if you feel like you don't want to take that one on feel free to, to defer but um, that's th what I'm what I'm trying to get at is is rather than focus on specific widths or, or rules and things, I want to understand what our, what we're trying to get. Yeah, the, the gist. Yes, where are we trying to go? So with the dock width, it's, it's basically... Right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, dock width is one, and then I'm going to go to um, uh, vegetation is my other question. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to ask both of those questions okay. the same, same way. So for dock width, it would be the shading impacts because there is quite a bit of science um, that they do respond to shade and they'll turn and go in another direction they will not go into it um, so 
there is documentation that it does impact what they're doing um, their migration the other is part of that shade is also the access so you've got if you're shading the um, the aquatic environment you're shading you're not you're not allowing the, the submerged vegetation to grow the for the small salmonids that's where their food source is it's associated with that submerged vegetation we can't see it but they can because they rely on very tiny things and they rely in, to, in being able to be in the very shallow area because they've got to stay out of the mouths of the big guys so that's net that's that's why that's a critical habitat um, so you've got two things with shading and their and the prey resource one is they have to be able to see it to get it and it needs photosynthesis to be out there to have the critters associated with it that they rely upon and we know that from science that they rely upon that that's part of their growth if they don't get from a to b at a certain size it's possible they're not going to make it so 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 in theory if a if a person could have a completely transparent dock yeah. there would be no heartburn about how wide that dock was because the the um, plants would be growing and the salmon yeah, would be in theory okay. and that's what they've been doing with some of the larger docks it's very problematic with cars and whatnot but ferry docks have done that um, the Clinton ferry dock being one of the examples of that so it's actually a uh, glass gla okay right where people walk not where cars drive mm -hmm. because you have safety okay um, I might add another issue in addition to the two that Barb mentioned are uh, predators and yes particularly smallmouth bass and pike minnow right you definitely have that in Lake Washington and that yeah. would be a place for them to hide and they love to hide under or they like those structures piers. and so it becomes a gauntlet for the salmon that are migrating we get two main migrations one coming out of Iscar Creek hatch hatchery which tends to hug around the north end of uh, Lake Washington and then the other coming out of the cedar they tend to hug around the southern end but both populations um, kind of hang out and migrate past Mercer Island. I would like to, and that's fine, um, but I'd like for you to show the, just for my own edification, the studies of that. You know, the, what I read, and maybe I'm reading the wrong stuff, but was the Tabor report that showed that I think it was 0.2% of the bass that they caught um, at Lake Washington, vicinity of Lake Washington, vicinity of Mercer Island, a very, you know, it was, it was a non-issue. So I respect what you're saying, Councilmember Gray. Uh, just let me see that documentation. Let me see that sign because what I read showed that it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, it was, it was not significant. Well, and certainly, Mike, the the Planning Commission folks have said that they landed where it sounds like you are at the moment so I, I too would like to have a, a better understanding of what uh, and I might what's, ask, what's been evaluated right. so that we can and I might ask uh, director uh, Stewart I mean uh, councilmember Grady has some studies that he says you know uh, shows where these the shading of the docks etc cetera, etc cetera, are harmful to the wildlife why weren't those included in the the uh, presentation leading up to this well as I, I mentioned I, I think the Planning Commission received any of the documents that were submitted and there's a very extensive page and a half that I think um, is on the website of um, I think Tabor is what three three studies something like that um, y you know I mean my my view is that if there's more evidence if there's more information out there that hasn't been put on the record I think I would welcome it. I think it's very important because one of the things that um, ecology will be looking for and others if there's an appeal is that we do have to explain why we're making our decisions and document why we're we're making those decisions to do one thing or the other. And the more information that you have and evaluate, I think the better off the city is going to be. So I went to three of those uh, design uh, our planning commission meetings. I think, Barb, I saw you at all three of them. Did you bring up to the commission that they were short some studies that would document these observations or these issues that you're bringing up that the cell monitors, when they won't go underneath the docks because of the shade? So uh, 
if you go back to the inventory that is the foundation for the SMP, it does quote, and, and you have a list of references, and I don't know if they follow under Exhibit 4 or what part of this, but they're actually in that document. You've got um, Karis Carroll that did the, put together the best available science for docks and in freshwater systems. You've got fish and wildlife documents already cited. You've got Tabor's documents cited. So there, those footnotes that you see at the beginning that are part of the Planning Commission recommendations, those are not the science that the inventory relied on. Those are additional pieces. That's that's the way I saw that. Well, I'll just make a request that you focus in on the, the key studies and present those to me or maybe to the council. Sorry, Excellent. Bruce, I didn't mean to. That. That's okay. I mean, we're, we're still on that same topic. Could, can I switch gears and ask sure. a vegetation question? And the, the, the way I teed this up at the last meeting was with um, uh, native plants could, could mean low-growing stuff like Mahonia or mm -hmm. it could mean cedar trees. There's a, there's a world of dis right. difference between them. Right. W what is it we're trying to achieve with natives and uh, so, okay. that we, so that we can understand better what regulations are going to help get us there? Right. So there's a water quality component to the native vegetation and our scientists would be looking at um, or our, our technical experts would be looking at the filtration function. So to them, what's happening on the, the rim of the lake, and there's going to be limitations in each jurisdiction as to how much they can put in there because of the way the lots are configured. But to get as much of that native vegetation in there, number one, you don't have to add fertilizer to that. It's doing its own. It grows in that environment. and. You know, you've, you do have animals that rely on that, and you'll see them nesting in that environment and utilizing it. So there's a human advantage to that, too. Um, but there's also the filtration that it can do. So lawns don't do the same thing. People need to fertilize, do pest control. That's not necessarily what you need to do with your native vegetation. So there's this element of water quality filtration that it does, and there's also the habitat. And there's the detritus that goes into the lake as a natural piece, which is also for the larger salmon. That's uh, part of their ecosystem, prey resource. So it's nothing to do then with um, uh, shade functions or, well, or things like that <coughs> that uh, would be generated by taller plants. It really doesn't have anything to do with plant height then. Well, it can. I mean, you definitely would have an advantage if you had a warm time when, or, or you have a shade it, you know, I don't want to exaggerate that for Lake Washington. Um, that's a very big lake, so we're not talking about changing the temperature across the lake. That would, that's just not going to happen. But yes, you would have, you could have some shading advantages. So that's an advantage to keeping the water cool on hot days. Our salmonids don't, they they don't do well in warm water. But in that case, they're not restricted. They can move out of it. But yeah, there is, but I don't want to exaggerate that point mm -hmm. in this particular environment. And th so this question of uh, native compatible was raised. Uh, it, it, I mean, there are a couple things here. Um, I don't think the language as I see it here says that lawn is not vegetation, but I think I heard in your comments earlier that grass does not equal vegetation. Uh, did I, did I yes, hear that's your what, interpretation right. correctly? It's not really seen as vegetation. And I think that your planning commission changed some language so that they were actually, they were getting to native grasses in, at least in one of their meetings, they were um, getting to delineate, they recognized that grass was not the vegetation we're looking for in a buffer zone. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what happened with that or what part that became of. But okay. yeah, no, it's not seen as part of a buffer. <laughs> the idea is to have the the filtration capacity that the native vegetation mm -hmm. provides. Okay. Can we ask Tim what happened I'm, to that? I'm set, thank you. Um, there was a lot of discussion. I would point you at the actual words in the regulation because that's where the Planning Commission settled out, and that would be on page 22. 22. So what um, 22A, and then the illustration is on page 23. So it says the vegetation coverage shall consist of a variety of ground cover shrubs and trees, excluding non-native grasses. 
variety of ground mm -hmm. cover shrubs and trees. Yeah. So that's what's required. Yes. Is that what ecology would find satisfactory? Right. Okay. Okay. Jane, do you have questions? You don't have to. Uh, well, yeah, I did have a question about um, <laughs> one of the. <laughs> These guys used up. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the speakers had a question. Had a question about the setback requirements for property owners who yes. are adjacent to um, a street end. And I, I went a little further explanation because I couldn't find it in uh, in the document itself. Yeah, George, you want to take this one? Let me introduction is that. We do have setbacks between property lines. When your property feet, line is, right? a, uh, mm -hmm. is a street end, mm -hmm. it's uh, greater than that. And that is a current regulation. And the Planning Commission chose to continue that current regulation. But George is our expert, so I'll defer to George. Thanks. For the record, and as an introduction, George Steyer, I'm your principal planner. So if you turn to page 17 of the exhibit, you'll see in the column next to the letter B, give everyone a second to get there what the requirement is specifically so um, I think there a portion of that regulation was mentioned which it said if your property is next to an urban park environment and again that's on page I believe 29 that map the street ends essentially then you've got a 50 foot um, setback from the lateral line for your dock for example or 50 percent of the water frontage of the property, whichever is less. So that's, a, that's an important part. And I think when we were sitting there, I had a little time to do an example. And everyone could do an, a different example if you like. But I just took a, one example. If you had a 50 foot uh, waterfront, 50 foot wide next to um, an urban park environment, you'd have a 25 foot setback next to the park and a 10 foot lateral line on the other side of your property, a 10 foot setback on the other. So to give you a 15 foot wide swath to put a dock. And of course, if you um, start reducing that down, you'll, you'll start doing the math. But that was just a typical example. And I think what the gentleman was saying was there's a much bigger setback adjacent to an urban park environment. Mm -hmm. Everyone else has a 10 foot setback. And, and George, why did that existing regulation exist. What, what was the municipal purpose that that served? I think, well, there's two points. Uh, I think originally that was adopted in 1974, whenever that was, and that was carried through to the existing regulations because your planning commission wanted to say, we only want to change what we have to. But that this issue did come up actually at the planning commission. They looked at this specifically. And so to get to your question, they said, no, we don't want to change it because we feel that and I'm paraphrasing what the Planning Commission is saying. I was looking for Councilmember Marshall to see if he was here. But my, my recollection of what they said was, no, we do feel that there should be a large setback from the public park to protect the public interest so there's not a dock right next to there or a canopy, for example. They wanted, that, they wanted to retain that larger setback. But, if, but the original intent of, of putting that there would not have been protecting the some recreational kind of activity at that street and if it was done back in the 70s I wonder did anybody do any research to find out why the Council and Planning Commission in the 70s did that well, I suspect it was no. an engineering reason and I, no, but, but it makes perfect sense because if, if someone wants to use that public street end to access the water then if you have a dock which is which is which it pinches it you got boats coming in on both sides you can easily see Somehow that interfering with the public use of the property. I mean, that, that remember we're not we're not talking about the uplands, about creating a 50-foot wide buffer on the upland right. side. It's only on the on the water side where the public is is gaining access to yeah. that. I, and I guess I'm just I'm projecting, but I'm guessing that that was adopted probably about the time that the the sewer system was put in. It, it was part of when all the ULIDs were created and they put in the lake line and they started hooking them up at those street ends that's where the clean outs are and they wanted unfettered access to get to those sewer utility those but, sewer facilities but, but i could see this really quick i mean if you've got a boat there's a beam that i mean you could tie it up on a dock that's what 10 feet off the line and the beam of the boat is 15 feet you're five feet into the street end on the water side 
No, that's wrong logic. You're not allowed to do that. You're on somebody else's property. I mean, it's, it happens all the time. Yeah, but we've got people you, right now that have encroached on our street ends for years that have never opened them up. No, if they encroach upon the city's property, then the city gets them off. Well, I know. I'm just telling you right now, there's a ton of these that are not opened up. Less something. How many of these are not opened up now? Oh, I don't know. Uh, quite a few. I, right. I guess what I will be urging the staff is to research that some more from the engineering point of view. It, it may well be part of the reason we do this is to take care of the sewer system. And that is a very different uh, logic than uh, what the access that somebody well, might have. But can we, can we have, before you direct staff to do that, can we have it find out whether there's a majority of the council who wants to go and change this policy which has existed since 1974? Well, what I'm hearing is that uh, one of the reasons we're doing it is because we've just always done it. I think it makes sense well, to review the same this rationale policy. for covered mortgages that was given, that we've, in the grand tradition of Mercer Island has covered mortgages, therefore we must continue them. Well, it's, logic, I mean, it's logical under certain circumstances. It's right. Okay. I, I, whether it's logical or not, I mean, it, it's a policy which has existed for 40 years, and, and all of a sudden, I mean, this is a strange context to be challenging that policy. Actually, in the analysis, I would appreciate if we looked at the financial aspects of it. I think the one individual who talked about it drew the connection with uh, with the uh, property values. How is that? I mean, how does that? It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's not a Lake threat. Washington. It's not private property you're dealing with. It's, it's this is. No, if you if your property, if you can't develop your property. As you might expect, the then that de that degrades the value of the and, property. And I guess I I'll point water. out again, I'm <clears throat> pounding on the same issue. If it is about uh, maintaining access to the sewer utility, we do that all over the island, and every city does it all over their communities around sewer mains and water mains, where you don't get to build on top of them with a house. I mean, it's just so we're not. It, it's not a taking when we do that. So it's a very normal thing. And, and you. I'll suspect it doesn't have to do with sewer maintenance because you know you can get those barges into little crevices and everything else. You know. Any other questions? I guess, Mr. City Manager, what I'm saying is I don't want to just be it's for sewer maintenance. I mean, the the maintenance equipment is designed to jiggle in between docks and whatnot. It you could well be right. I just think it's worth us checking it out. I just want to come back to this uh, translucent dock uh, question for a second. In my brief pass through this, I didn't see where we were trying to specify just how translucent docks had to be or what, what sort of... Um, for new docks, the uh, standard is 40%. Okay. <coughs> and that is... Um, thank you. That is something that is reasonably easy for a uh, homeowner to know what sort of design they could pick and they would likely achieve that yeah um, so there's, there's yeah there's a lot of illustrations about how you can accomplish that one of the best to look at if you're at the <coughs> maritime park new maritime park in seattle by the big park restoration on lake union there's a couple new bridges and walkways in there that have really good illustrations of various types of um, graded docks and overwater structures that you can see how they actually work. Barbara, did you have some more examples? Yeah. Because I've been looking into the, what the bindings are. So they've been studying um, ferry terminals in particular because there is, you know, there's quite a bit of permitting and retrofitting that goes on there. And, but plus you have the funding for doing some of these studies. Um, so, and what they found, and this is Patel Labs, um, their SQUIM laboratory, so they were, what they found is that the grading was probably the most effective. So they had lighting that went under the dock, solar put it under the dock, they had um, translucent panels, and they had, um, the grading, different types of grading. So they said the fiberglass grading appeared to be the most effective. That's what they concluded in that study. And I, I can provide you that study, so that, you know, the PDF of that, so that you can take a look at that for yourselves. But um, so 
reading that. Now, the 40%, that's based on findings in those bigger docs. The, the, you say 40%, well, that, that's not really a tight measurement. So you're going to talk about the, ty the type of doc, not I, the I'm sorry, just so I, I'm clear, the, by 40%, you mean the 40. It, it, it must transmit 40%? Yeah, of the, of I the think light? that's what they're trying to get at, but I don't okay. think anybody's really measured that for single family docs. Okay. But that's the standard. So uh, do we have anything from these studies that's giving us a s – so I, I'm, I'm a fish. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, swimming. that's the idea. I'm swimming along. <laughs> no. I come to an area that's not dark but is – Yeah, well, av yeah. avoid that whatever the predatory fish is, but the big, right. bass. The big mouth bass. But, <laughs> but am, is, is there uh, still a reason to narrow the dock – if it's translucent, uh, so I mean, as opposed to dark, and you know, so dark and narrow versus wide and uh, uh, translucent, you know, wh where do we land in terms of uh, our behavior if we are fish? Right. So, so we have underwater photography. We see that when you know that some fish will come to light changes during the day too. So even though we have underwater photography, we also got a chance to see them as the sun went down and the line changed. So they were definitely responding. Juvenile salmon and chinook were responding to changes in that light pattern. They would wait and then pass under. But not every individual fish would do that. Some would go off out another way. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean in the single family dock that they're going to behave that way, but it does seem that they do. If you read enough biological assessments about docks, you can start to see there's varied behavior from the, with the different small fish in response to a dock. So I would think that the more light, the less they have a dark shadow line, the more likely they are to go under. Otherwise, they'll just go along with the line. Or and wait on the line. <laughs> and similarly, is there is there then something that says that they they can look out four feet, yeah, four, right. four feet, and say, "Oh, that's not too far. Yeah, off. I'm going to go for it." Okay, as opposed nobody, to, uh, right. Well, nobody feet. has measured that, so will they do it at eight feet when they do? It? But they don't need a lot of distance to they they need to be able to see light at the other end too. So. You see what I'm okay. saying? We have seen that if you have a hole in a dock over here, you they could possibly go over there if they can perceive that light, and they have demonstrated that. But nobody has measured exactly how many feet. So it's a precautionary. It's it's like Mike had brought up that Cyril had brought up. Oh well, the science isn't definite. Well, the, it's a precautionary approach. We know what has impacted them. We know that. Uh, we. Scientists are very conservative in what they allow as a conclusion from their particular work because their credibility is based on that. But as policymakers, you need to take a precautionary approach so that you don't have more degradation is an important thing to consider. So that's where you're in that that important piece. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So just okay. Just yeah. Like Dan, do you want you go ahead. Well, I said, so ecology though is going to submit next week or this coming week a list of concerns you have with the current draft, as, as I understand what you're saying. Right. I've done that yes. a couple of times already, but I'll, I'll review it. Yeah, and many of the five issues we talked about last week were based upon ecology's previous comment letters. So those are issues which ecology has already called out as from there it's potentially problematic. Yes, that's correct. And the commission's already reviewed those, and they've already produced this SMP, the recommendation, in consultation with DOE. Is that correct? No, not I wouldn't say in consultation. Well, in, they in were with, informed, with respect or being having been they, informed they were with DOE's informed review. Informed by DOE, and then they made a choice that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. Quick question, Tim. I can't find it in here at the moment, but I remember a figure uh, telling how many. Um, undeveloped lots there are currently around the island and that only 30. I remember 10 uh, are in buildable sites is that 
right? Only 10 sites? I, I think it's about, I think the number that's in my head is about, is, is about 30, but when you actually look at the characteristics of the land, mm -hmm. realistically you come down So to there a, could only be like 10 it, new, it new docks, 10 brand new docks that where no docks had existed um, before. I'm not sure we can go that far because we may have some properties that do not have docks now that are existing. I so. guess the, the point that, that I think Jane's trying to make is uh, how many docks do we have right now? 647. And so if you're 10 like plus or minus or even up to 30 uh, against an existing base of 600, I mean, I think it's a great point. Mm -hmm. We're the talking about very few brand new The master lots. program in terms of, of regulating <coughs> new facilities is actually quite small. But the key issue there is the, your replacement, your repair replacement policy. Right. Once, once you have no net loss. decided that one, that will influence a lot of uh, how much time you want to put into this. Well, that's, and that's huge. That, that's a basic policy discussion we need to have, and we should probably start having it because we're going to run out of time here. This is where we're going on this thing. I mean, that, that's really the key issue, what we're doing with, mm -hmm. re we're with replacement docks. Replacement. How are you going to deal with a built environment? Correct. Once well, things get so, so, so I understand what our alternatives are. From what Barbara was saying is the other communities have approached this on a percentage basis, and presumably what that means is that if they're replacing more than X percent of the dock, then it, they need to comply with the, the new regulation. They basically need to... That's fairly clear. Tear, tear it up and, and start all over again with under the new regulations, essentially. Um, no, there's a big difference. It's whether the replacement, think about the, uh, the size of the dock differently than the uh, quality of the material. Well, what, in, how, do you, the how do you apply the percentage? What's it applied on the basis of value or That's size, or how do you do it? Yeah. Uh, Mostly it is a percentage of material replaced, so if you replace more than 50% or it could be value, I don't know, I'm sure. Miles? Oh, the number of piles, so if you get 50% of the piles being, um, being replaced, then you have to meet the new standard. And the, the, one of the questions so would be meeting the new standard in terms of the new uh, materials or meeting the new standard in terms of size. Well, that, so and, that, that's, and that's, that's, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, I'm wondering what right. does ecology have a what they consider an acceptable way of doing this or an unacceptable way of doing this? Or so what we've been talking with the core because that's a good question, and that's really with these built environments. What's important is drawing your thresholds. So. As opposed to when you're looking at homes that are expanding on the shoreline, they tend to talk about value. When they're looking at docks, they tend to talk about your 30% of your decking material. Anything up to 30% is a minor. And 50% of your pilings, that might tell you you need to replace all of your pilings. That's those thresholds ecology would like to see in this SMP, and that's And that's an over important a certain, like 30% over 12 months or 30%? How do you that's another important piece, right, yeah. is, you know, and when does it not become to have a, a safety valve in there so that we know when it's not just going to be accumulated over, the, you know, you're letting them replace the whole dock over a period of time but without coming into compliance. So not to have that piecemeal over three years. But I, I gather what we've got now in front of us would be dead on arrival and mm -hmm. for that well it wouldn't be dead on arrival kind of yeah that's because it would have to be changed it would have to include some thresholds so that you can start to come into compliance because what you have is a built environment okay yeah so i, I mean that's to me is as, as, as you said rich that's where the action is on this on this issue and i think we need to have a discussion as to whether we want staff to come back with an alternative proposal or several alternative proposals that we can Look at and consider and if they have them. that. Well, we have, yeah, we have some of them, but uh, I think you're right. I think this is one of the fundamental issues, and it'll be top as we look at the matrix. That one will go right to the top in terms of the amount of effort we put in over the next week to look at the analysis of that issue, as well as a couple alternatives for you to consider on how you might approach this. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's well, but, the, but just but just to see how we're going to move this thing forward. Right. Just, I mean, can we get a sense of the council as to? I mean, there's two ways to approach this. There's one you can do the suggestion that that um, Bob Thorpe said is just submit it and and then fight it out, or we can come up with something that that we believe has a has a better chance of being approved. Let me let me float something because it's getting late. Um, we're we still got a lot to discuss here. This is a big thing. You've just gave us um, Tim. You said that there are different alternatives yes. to look at this, and I'm wondering um, if the council would find it agreeable to come back the next council meeting when we're continuing discussing this, and have Tim come forward with those alternatives that they've looked at, and so we can have a discussion a little more in depth mm -hmm. into those. You know, par part of the problem we're going to have, though, is yeah. Mike is out next week, um, and Elle is back. I'm out the following week, and I clearly have an interest in this one also, Right. the next meeting. Well, I think what well, we all do. No, well, I, I realize, but we're going to run into, I mean, it, you're saying October. We don't have a particular I, I deadline to... Yeah. Yeah. But you, but you wonder whether what makes sense on this, this is schedule... Like even a well a weekend day or something where we just we just no we need to get away we need to get away from that scheduling according to other people's schedule we have a schedule and you know you try to make it and sometimes you're not there sometimes that's if you have a quorum you continue with business well I, I would say this I I would try to accommodate everyone as best we can because this is important and of all the issues that we're going to get our arms around this year this is probably it. And so, and and the number of citizens and the island that this impacts is huge. Mm -hmm. And so, I would I would err to uh, let's accommodate and try to make sure that everyone feels good about this process. Uh, okay, if that's what the council wants to is do, is that right? I mean, I don't. Am I talking to myself, I, or well, is that? And there are consequences to that. Because uh, I'll have to do again another rearranging of your planning schedule uh, to lay these things out, and it'll take uh, probably the summer to get through this. Uh, that's my guess anyway, because I, you guys are very much now into the details. You're, you're looking at the science. Um, you, you're at where the planning commission was for 18 months, so <laughs> I, this is going to take a little more time. So I would ask that you be flexible in letting me come back with a revised planning schedule. And there may be issues on your on your uh, work plan that we just decide aren't going to get done this year. Because I don't know how you're going to be able to get all the work done. But, you know, but I, I don't agree with you on that, Rich. I don't think we are where the planning commission was 20 in the, in the third, second or third meeting. We're tonight. No, I don't agree. We're, we, you know, we're, if how are we, Tim? Just dealing with... No Dealing with the, <laughs> we, we've we've got some conceptual issues, which you know Tim has even said it's there are not difficult language changes to make that we can we can address. I mean we can make a decision, for example, to go with six foot docks or four foot docks or or and and that's not we don't have to sit there and argue about this for eternity. It's, it's a very straightforward question. And I and believe you can do that. I agree. You can do that. And this can be a policy discussion, but what I heard tonight was you, it went into the science. You went to where the planning commission spent its 18 months. But you, you're going to have to discipline yourselves to not do that if you're going to do this in... Oh, no. No. Because, because policy should spring from the science. And so the reason I exposed uh, the lack of science in many of these areas is for that very reason. Well, you, have, you have inconsistent policies in this draft that are not based on science. I, I totally understand it. Don't, and, don't that, take and, it and that's a part of our responsibility is to look at the policy and then when the po and so I started at the policy level when I saw inconsistencies throughout the plan then I asked Tim to give me a list of the references which I got, I got just before the meeting tonight and having looked at that I saw huge gaps yeah, and, I, that, I, I and, I, and now I understand why you have inconsistent policies is because it's based on a very scant I, I, look at, the, I, I at the state of science. I totally understand that. And I mean, what I got out of the discussion was that at least some members of the council fundamentally don't agree with how the Planning Commission got to its recommendation. And, and where the, f the fundamental breakdown occurred was at the scientific level. 
So in order to fix that, you're going to have to spend some time at that I, level. Well, I, <clears throat> okay, let me go bring it back. What Rich has said is that this is going to be, we're going to drag this thing out a little bit, okay? And we're going to have to have flexibility in the planning schedule to do that. Do I see from the council that that is acceptable? Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm, a, I'm waiting for your, your, the council, or the council, or the uh, the commission, the professional folks. They spent 26 uh, sessions on this, and we should give them deference in the presentation that they've given to us. And, and I'm looking for that speech from you that we often get well, and many times from the commissions. And, and for one, I, I mean, I, I subscribe to that. Well, let me just speak to the point. I think that you've got, you have seven people up here, and I don't think there's consensus on that. As much as I will concur with what you just said, I'm hearing other needs from other council members here to take this vote and to move this along. And I think that out of respect for them, and this is a big decision, that we ought to give the time and, and the flexibility to get there. That's the question. At the end, I can say where I'm coming on on this, and I'm good with it. Well, I, I mean, if you're looking for consensus, um, if we go with the logic of we're waiting for a full council, right, we're waiting for a full council, you know, if we have the missing council member here, I kind of suspect, my gut feel is, we could take a vote on what this MP looks like, that, what this SMP looks like right now, and we'd get it approved. You know, well, I, that would be, it would be very interesting for this council to approve something, Mike, which we know is not going to be approved by Ecology, just so we so, can... See, I disagree with that. I, I listened to what Mr. Thorpe said, and I, he no, seems I've, to have I've, some I've, some credibility on that. I, you know, I've known Bob for many years, and I think he's a very credible individual, but when the Department of Ecology's representative sits here in front of you and says, don't waste your time, I think patch a little bit more credibility to that. So let's go back to this a little bit. Um, the question was, more time, let Rich work with the planning schedule, and we're going to let this thing kind of... Let's just, let's... And then the next At least is... Let's assume that the time frame within which we're going to uh, get something off to ecology is probably uh, by the end of the summer. Is there any consequences to that? No. Okay. So there's no... Okay. Other than no. staff time and... Well, I know, but there's, there's, no, there's, no there's no penalty, there's no anything, there's nothing. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's there's no consequences to that. I thought there was a consequence. Is it... Maybe I'm mixing up some, with something else. I thought we were under the gun to get this thing in by the time schedule that the city manager had set for us. Well, we have uh, we have an internal objective uh, based upon your work program. We also have an external objective based on the ecology grant where we um, told them at the end of the second quarter of this year. Um, however... Well, right. So um, why say that there's not... However, many cities have been somewhat tardy in meeting their deadlines. Okay. All right. So then it sounds like there is consensus to add flexibility to it. Also I'm hearing is that there's interest in looking at these these alternates that, that evidently the planning commission looked at. Yeah, what, what uh, I've heard tonight is that we have a number of big issues, uh, including the nonconformity and the phasing of the replacement that we will then take a look at, try to get some of the big ones together for the 17th, and present you with ways that you can uh, address those issues, um, what you would like to do. For example, last time uh, on the dock issue, you had an illustration where your option is to go with a six foot uh, the whole way, or four feet and then six feet after 30. Making those changes are really don't take any time at all. It's the decision on which way we're going to go that will be the crisis part. I have a, just a quick question too, Tim. Okay. The um, the vegetation planning, as I understand it, goes with a brand new dock. So what would be you know how would the vegetation requirements go uh, with replacement or replacing a partial dock or? Yeah, the vegetation standards are mm -hmm. landward improvements, so it would be a new house. Oh, nothing to do with the dock then. Uh, George, help me out here. 
If you replace it, totally replace uh, an old dock, for example, do you have to do the um, the landward imp um, vegetation improvements? Not right now. Under the draft code, yes, because that would be considered a new dock if you're replacing, you take out the old one and put in a, a brand new one, essentially, okay. that would be. The other one is... No, but not if you completely replace it. If you completely right. replace it, then you don't have to do anything. Right. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So if you replace it, you don't have to do anything. If you... It, but that, that's, no, but that's, that's, the weird, that's the weird part about this code. If you, re, if you replace it with something that is in any way different than the existing one, then it's not clear to me at all what, what you're left with at that point. So you're put in this very awkward situation that if you've got like a 1,000-square-foot a dock, and God forbid you want to put in a 900-square-foot dock, so you're not replacing it, entire, completely replacing it anymore, that looks like now that's a new dock, and you have to comply with the standards, so it almost forces you to put in a thousand square foot dock in order to get grandfathered. That's the way it's written. Yeah, and the key uh, to meet the no landward loss provision, Tim, on page three, is you're relying on future new or expanded structures in order to meet the new net loss provision over time. Mm -hmm. And again, as I pointed out earlier, you, you're not going to get there. If you only have 30 unimproved lots, you, you're maybe going to have 10 new docks. Um, you know, we're 100 years into the future before you meet the no less net yeah. loss provision. The Planning Commission's view was that the standard, the baseline, that you measure no net loss from is the existing condition today. Theory being that if you replace in kind, no expansion, then there is not a net loss. That over time, as other changes are made, then there would be a net gain. But, I mean, that's the Planning Commission. That's where they landed. I, I, I know that there are other views of the world. I know, hey. but, okay, but just replay what you said. So over time, what benefits are we going to accrue if at every turn they're replacing the exact same overwater structure? The benefits would accrue with other improvements that would happen through those 20 years. Like what? Uh, like the implementation of stormwater, like the implementation of the critical area ordinances, the, uh, the potential improvements, restoration in the parks, all of those things would be positive impacts to the shoreline environment. Um, I'm going to kind of take control of this a little bit. I think that these, what you're discussing now, would be covered under the options when we resume this discussion later on, correct? Well, we'll, uh, we'll try. We've heard okay. a lot tonight. If, if we'll we try to package these into issues and then do the analysis on oh. the issue with alternatives. Okay. Um, what I'd like then is for everyone, just a minute, it, what I'd like you to do is um, when we say we're going to try to schedule this and make it as, you know, try to get everyone at these meetings, okay? Um, Rich uh, has talked to me about the complexity of trying to get everyone at meetings with everyone's busy schedules and what they do and, and get 100% attendance. If we work on 100% um, attendance at these, we can't, we won't probably be able to accommodate everyone's request to be 100% at other things. It, they basically, it, I've asked. It'd be too complicated. I've asked. I'm asking the council if this is the issue where all seven of you want to be there for each session okay we'll, we'll work on that it's going to take a while but please don't ask that for other issues because it's, it's going to get it, really complicated I, I just can't do that I mean, it's so too complicated fine. okay so right. th that's the one logistic <laughs> thing is that agreeable with everyone yeah. okay all right it, Mike you had a question I want a uh, point of disclosure is I wanted to do this at the very beginning just didn't have the opportunity I have a dock. We're aware of this. I know. I just point of disclosure. And I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I'd like to advance res resolution 1440 and tend to adopt an update to the SMP to the May 17th, 2011 council meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Yes. Uh, who's not there on the 17th? From Monday the 16th? Uh, there is a, uh, an action in the court that, uh, that will require the mayor, the deputy mayor, the city attorney, and the city manager, and could run into the evening.
You seconding the motion? I second your okay. motion. <laughs> so, all right, so we now have a motion and it has been seconded. And that would be? I mean, I, I don't mind voting for because I think we need to continue the discussion, but I think we need to acknowledge that any final decisions will have to await to having a full council to, to make those final decisions. So we could have a discussion and try to see whether we can find middle ground on, on any of this stuff, but I think ultimately we need to have seven council members to, for the final. Well, let me, um, Katie, if I could ask you a question. So this motion, and seconded, um, actually it's to May 17th, right? That's where I said okay, May 17th. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I missed that. Um, essentially, that is, our, it, that is what we're aspiring to with this motion. If we don't have the vote, then we can continue that on for a vote at a later council meeting. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. This is the neither the motion. Uh, the motion isn't really necessary. There will be a point at which this is this is Tim's advice to you to adopt a resolution saying, by adopting this resolution, we will transmit our. Um, Tentatively okay. blessed uh, shoreline master program to DOE for for comment, um, and then they'll do the review and you get the thing back, and then you can ultimately adopt the ordinance sometime later in the year. You'll get to that point of being ready to do the resolution when you're ready. I don't think that's going to happen in May or June. I think that's probably going to happen in okay. August. So uh, you can go ahead and and do this action. Uh, but you're just going to have to continue um, sort of this resolution. You're going to have to table it until you're actually ready to approve the resolution, which won't happen on the 17th. And, and I'll just point out one more thing, too. You're still having a public hearing. And as I understand it, the record is still open because the anticipation is that there's going to be some written documents submitted at least this coming week. So you can leave the hearing open until the next council meeting. You have, you have a number of options, as the city manager has pointed out, but that's a piece that we need to make sure we um, tie up crisply so that we have our I, proper record. I thought that I closed the public hearing. I, I think you closed the public comment at that point in time, and then you turned to staff. Right. But, but you could keep the record open, and because people okay, have yeah. suggested that they're going to so submit. So technically, we're still having a public hearing right now. Yes, you are. Okay. And if we pass this motion, it then ends the public hearing. Is that correct? No, all, all of this so motion is saying is the resolution will come up for consideration at on the 17th. Um, if you if you approve it, then when we'll get to the 17th, assuming we talk about it, all this, you're going to have to table it because you're not going to be ready to adopt the resolution at your next meeting. It's no harm, no foul. How do you publicize that the public hearing remains open? Just as we did. Just as we did for this, we can just we just say a continuation of the public hearing. On the public notice. I think that would be Correct. okay. Good. All right. Okay. So no harm, no foul if this passes and it just goes on. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? It's been seconded. Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. It passes. All right. And so Tim, what'd you hear from us? Lots of wonderful well, ideas. Before, <laughs> before we, let me make sure I understand. What did you decide about May seventeenth? Are we going to talk shoreline master program, yes. or are we not? We're going to we're we, going to talk, but we're not going to make any final decisions. Okay, Correct. that's fine. And on any, on any issues, we're right? So then here, talk, keep talking. Well, I don't know how you can make that decision. How, how do you make that decision if we're going to bring it up? How are you going to handcuff the council, which is a quorum, that they can't make a decision? The choice then, Mike, is if you want to wait. I mean, what we have, I think, decided, or a number of us would prefer, is that we do this, make decisions as a full council. We cannot do anything on the 17th, and we cannot do anything on the 6th at all, but we're trying to figure out ways of advancing this, and yet then still not making final decisions until we've got all seven people in the room. And I think that's correct. What we're trying to do is accommodate everybody on this because of the magnitude of this. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is I don't think we need to, if you, be careful what you ask for because then nothing's going to happen for a long time in this. 
Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, um, that ends our regular business. Uh, let's go on to council member absences. We need a motion to excuse council. Yeah, uh, second. second. Okay. You know, I've been trying to get hold of council member Janky for the last week. Now, I, you know his history, and I think I was no, watching the video. I think <laughs> I, w I was watching the videos. Uh, with Osama bin Laden. Yeah, yeah. And I know. I know. I saw a bald-headed, gray-haired guy in there. I, I was thinking. The I same think. Thing. I think he strapped up, laced up the boots. He, he's in. Was it number six? He, That's his team. He was the it? guy in that that helicopter gunship doing the backflip out of it. Okay, so. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, all right. All those in favor, say aye. <laughs> aye. Opposed? Okay. Planning schedule, you're going to start working well, on it. We got other absences. We've got Grady on the 17th. Oh. Who else? Hey, and uh, it's not my fault. I had the 16th. I, I got, I got you know, many moons ago. It was our. We did it to you. <laughs> well, you were gone so, when we discussed this last. So anybody know other dates? Dan, you are gone. Okay. Any other? Uh, okay. And Bruce, I know you're gone in June? No, I'm July? June, July. You are here. June, I'm here. All right. July, May, yeah. Both of them? Probably. All right. I'm just trying to keep track here as we try to schedule this thing. Okay. Can I just remind the council to speak into their microphones? Thank you. <laughs> oh, does does anybody else know any other summer dates that you are you know you're gone? Yeah, I'll, I will be gone on July fifth. So, All right. Anybody so we're, else? So we're basically looking at trying to do this shoreline thing. The first solid votes in the last second meeting in June, right? Maybe. Or August, like I August. Or August. Yeah. Like I said, we'd probably be Yeah, or August. Yeah. Okay. So uh But you know, but uh, what I can see us doing, Rich, is, is making some solid votes in June, which then directs staff to 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 make changes that they then come back to us in August with the actual language. I, I think it's possible. It just depends on how much detail you guys get into. I, I think it's possible to do this thing um, fairly efficiently. It's up to you guys. Okay, anything else in the planning? Uh, we do owe you somewhere on here a date on parking on the Mercer Ways. So I will get that in there. Okay. Board appointments, there are none. Council member reports. Jane, starting on this end, anything? No. Dan? No. Mike? Mike? Chris? Um, Mike Ciro and I attended a uh, uh, community conversation about uh, sharing the roads yeah, amongst drivers and bicyclists this last week. It was well done, I think well put together. There were 18 or 20 folks who attended and I think good progress was made in the conversation. So I, uh, I believe that the folks who ran that are moving forward on trying to put together some uh, overarching thoughts as to uh, overarching uh, Ideas that they, I believe, they're going to come to council with before they go much further than that. Mike, help me out if you think I've got that wrong. And um, so we should be seeing something back from them before they move then forward to try and implement in the community. But they're going to be coming to us, I think, looking for council um, support and uh, feedback with the thought that this would be something that then would become a citizen and staff collaboration towards. Uh, community messaging so it was well done and the last little note uh, you probably got the all got the article that our school system now is what rated one of the top ten in the country uh, second. Second. second 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 in the country second in the country excuse me in, uh, in, that, in that bracket, in that bracket of size. so very cool uh, <laughs> the name that, is, uh, school 
gave us a school district exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if you see Gary or every, at the school uh, board, uh, well done. Kudos to them. So with that, well, uh, let, let me add something yeah. on the school, though. Uh, for those of you who hadn't seen in the paper, uh, a small school in eastern Washington, a uh, town called Bridgeport, is a finalist, one of six in the country to hopefully get the president to give a commencement address. And talk about a, a wonderful story. A great story. Only 200 students in the entire school. 100% of the students are on the federal um, meal program. They have a 94% graduation rate. All 37 seniors are going to college. Median income, $30,000. It's an great, unbelievable great story. story uh, rural town, and it's all about really good educators. Yep. So it's, just it's a, a fantastic great story. Great principal, superintendent, a bunch of good teachers. Well, and I was telling it to folks uh, today because I typically refer back to one of my favorite sayings: uh, "For those to whom much is given, much is expected," and and for these folks, it's for those to whom little has been given, much is expected. Yeah. You sound like Spider-Man. Yes. Yeah. Um, with that, hey, one other thing I have to tell you that I got talked into um, on May 20th, I was talked into the fundraising for the Mercer Island High School marching band to raise dough to go to the Rose Bowl, and they have put together a team to play against the Harlem Globetrotters, and I will be playing against the Harlem Globetrotters. So if you want to see something really funny, I would say the 20th, it's got to be worth money. It's got to be worth money. So, And Dave Ross and I are on the same team. So there you go. And that's their height. And that's their height. And we got Steve Litzo on this, and... Oh, well, I don't know. You can talk to these guys, but let's see. Who else we got? John Harrison, Jane Sayers. Uh, I don't know some of these. Kelly John Lewis, a security guy. Hopefully he can play. Is he good? Kelly can take him out, yeah. Is that right? He's as big as those guys. Okay, and uh, Parker Bixby, Ryan Lane, David Bentley, you know, and, yeah. Now, he's a ringer. I think, uh, yeah, this will be. So, anyway, it looks like Dave Ross and I are going to be, uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> the guards. <laughs> You'll be stuffed. We'll be stuffed. Okay, it could be a lot of fun. Anyway. They might be a little older than they used to be. Awesome. Actually, it's the Globe hey. I think the deal is it's the Globetrotter alumni, so you're getting. Let's hope so. It's not the current ones. It's really like old ones. Really, really old, old ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Wheelchairs. <laughs> okay. All right. Council meeting's over. <laughs>